Chair, it's nine o'clock. You're ready to start. Okay. Uh, good morning on this January 26th at nine o'clock, uh, 2021. Uh, to the meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes, Supervisor Koenig. Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. And Chair McPherson? Here. Uh, we will uh, now move to item number two. And be before we have a moment of silence, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that uh, the passing of a great person for our county, uh, Mr. Robert Bob Shepard. Uh, he was a tremendous person who uh, was a finance director for the city of Santa Cruz for 14 years. He uh, came to, uh, uh, he worked with the county before becoming finance director. And then he was uh, chair of the county oversight, uh, treasury oversight committee. Then he went into teaching at San Jose State and at UCSC from, uh, he taught up there for, from 1983 to 2015. And he was the uh, founder and professor of accounting uh, up there and uh, received some statewide excellence award uh, for teaching and uh, from the California Society of CPAs Outstanding Educator Award, a, a tremendous accomplishment. He was a tremendous person, a uh, great family man, and we're gonna miss Robert Shepard. He is a great public service for us. I don't know if anybody else might have a comment with anyone. If not, um, we'll have a moment of silence and then recite the P Pledge of Allegiance. Have a moment of silence. <laughs> Okay, I think we will now recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I think it's uh, appropriate to, uh, you can be seated as you, we recite the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We will uh, now go to item number three, the consideration of late additions to the agenda, additions and deletions to the consent and regular agenda. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Palacios, do we have anything? Uh, yes, Chair uh, McPherson, we do have a number of corrections and an addenda to the agenda. On the regular agenda, item number 12, there's a correction. The item should read, consider directing the planning department to explore a permitting process for tiny homes, including movable tiny homes, tiny homes on wheels, and tiny homes on foundation in the ADU code amendments as legal accessory dwelling units as outlined in the memorandum of Supervisor Koenig and Supervisor McPherson. There's also additional materials. There's a revised memo packet pages 201 and 203. On the consent agenda, on item number 34, there's additional materials, attachment E, ADM 29 form, and attachment F, grant information worksheet. On item 40, there's a revised memo, packet page 503. On item 51, there's a, a correction. The item should read, defer to February 23rd, 2021, Approval of agreements for CZU lightning complex fire emergency actions related to road debris removal, ditch cleaning, bridge replacement, road reconstruction, and culvert and guardrail repairs impacting critical roadway facilities and direct the Public Works Department to return on or before March 23rd, 2021 with administration status of emergency work closeout and final costs on each as recommended by the Deputy CAO, Director of Public Works. There's on this item, there's also an additional materials. There was a revised memo packet page 602. And then we have one addenda on the consent agenda. This is item 53.1. This is to direct the chair to write letters to our st state legislative delegation in support of Senate Bill 74, the Keeping California Working Act as recommended by Supervisor Coonerty. There's a board memo printout uh, there's bill text of SB 74, and there's a fact sheet to keep uh, California working at. 
That concludes the uh, corrections and addenda to the agenda, Chair McPherson. Thank you. Um, okay, um, we will move to item, um, excuse me just a second. Um, we'll now move to uh, public uh, comment. Uh, and before we, uh, we get there, I would just like to make a comment of my own. It's hard to believe uh, that we might have a real debris flow crisis uh, tomorrow or in the days following. Um, in this sunny day that we're experiencing right now without much wind, but uh, we expect a very heavy rainstorm with winds possibly up to 50 or 60 miles an hour uh, tomorrow night. Um, I just wanna thank everyone involved for the debris flow and evacuation planning. This county has been planning for this, uh, well, we hope this event may never come. We hope it never does, but we've been planning for months on how, how best to plan for this situation and try to target where the storm might hit. Um, but I wanna just, I can't overstate how critical it is for people to evacuate after receiving a warning. The Sheriff's Department yesterday started, I think at nine in the morning and went into the late afternoon to try to contact as many um, uh, of the households. I think there's 2,800 households with 5,000 people. Whoops, did you lose me? I'm sorry if you did, uh, let's see. We hear you, we hear you, Chairman. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, I'll get back on. Um, and there's 5,000 people uh, that were uh, in, involved. Uh, the evacuation points at uh, San Jose Valley Schools, uh, at uh, Pacific Elementary School in Davenport, and then at the community center in uh, Scotts Valley will be available for people to come and park their cars or trailers there if they wish. Um, the, uh, the evacuation of animals would, uh, will have to be going to the fairgrounds as the staging point for PG&E is at the Graham Hill uh, uh, showgrounds now. Um, our, our planning process has been significant and in the end, I think it is a willingness of our residents to evacuate that will really truly save lives. Uh, we know it's a lot to ask to leave your home, especially if the debris flows don't actually materialize, but the conditions are there for it to happen. So we need to be cautious and prepared. And I want to uh, just urge anyone to adhere to the evacuation orders that they have received, and we hope this gets past us as soon as possible if it all it arrives. Uh, but I, we just, uh, I can't overstate how much, uh, how much time and effort has gone into this from so many departments uh, to make things safe for everyone should a, 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 a debris flow activity really take place. So thank you everyone for adhering to those warnings and, and those orders, uh, we appreciate it very much. Chair McPherson. Um, yes. This is Carlos uh, Palacios. Uh, I believe we skipped over item uh, number four. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. That's just my, uh, okay, I was getting a little anxious, I guess. Uh, item number four, thank you. Uh, uh, the announcement by board members of items removed from the consent agenda to the re uh, regular agenda. Is there anyone that wanted to remove an item? Let me see here. I'm sorry, did I lose you for a while? You lost us for a little bit, but you're back now. Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know what's happened. The storm hasn't hit, I'll just put it that way. Excuse me, I, I skipped over item number four, the announcement by board members of items they want to have removed from consent to the regular agenda. Is there any item that you would like to have removed? Any board member? Okay, seeing none, I've made my public comment about the free flow. Are there any other comments from the public uh, this is the time for any person uh, may address the board uh, once during the public comment period, not exceeding two minutes. The comments must be directed to items on today's consent and closed agenda items. Yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or on a topic on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction, not on today's agenda, but within the jurisdiction of the board. Uh, we'll take public comments now up to 30 minutes and if necessary, additional time for public comments will be allowed after we uh, continue end today's regular agenda. 
Do we have any public comments? Good morning, Chair. And yes, we do. And I will just reiterate that we have on the um, slide in front of people who are watching through Zoom how to um, connect either by telephone and or through the Zoom app. We have five hands up. The first person is calling with a telephone number that ends in 1999. If you give me one second, I'll bring up the timer and you can start. Okay, so speaker number 199, you will be asked to be unmuted. You have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please expect, accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Can I be heard? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. Um, um, I'm going to take the two minutes. I wish I had longer. You know, as part of the uh, consent agenda, item number 17, approval of the reading by title of any ordinance considered for adoption that may appear on this agenda, and then it goes into some detail. Um, I don't know. I'm questioning that. Nothing's really going to change. Um, item 14A that has to do with a conference with legal counsel, threat to public services or facility, government code section 54957A. Who knows what you guys are going to be talking about, um, but I, as a concerned community member, would like to know more about this. Um, I've spoken on many subjects in the past. Uh, with what's going on in our county and the nation and the world, there's a lot of troubling things going on. And I've spoken about the ICD codes where any two members who are chosen or elected could decide to imprison any other committee member or things maybe even worse than that. So with the limited time I have left, um, I've been involved with some service groups that provide films to the public to educate the public on things that are going on. And there were two community members from out of this county that traveled to this county to discuss some things. Now, I don't know how many contact tracers they have in the Gilroy County, but in Santa Cruz, we have 70. And there's generally less than seven people that speak in these counties for these meetings. And it'd be nice if we could have three minutes. So what they were saying and sharing with us is that the contact tracers are going to largely residences where English is the second language and they are getting these people to be tested. And I know looking at the information on the on the Thank you. The next speaker is Olivia Martinez. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. All right. This is Olivia Martinez. I'm the Region 2 Director for SEIU Local 521. Um, so I'm calling um, regarding um, item 25 of the consent agenda. And um, I had sent an email to all the Board of Supervisors in December letting you know that the City of Santa Cruz had approved in December to extend um, the FFCRA sick leave for their employees. And we were very grateful that they did that. Um, other agencies have done the same thing after we've asked them to do so. Um, the county um, has agreed to extend the FFCRA sick leave. However, we are asking the board to approve it to be retro to January 4th. We've seen um, from the beginning of January 4th an escalation of members that have been COVID-19 um, positive or their family members. And we feel that many of them have struggled um, because they don't have enough sick time or they've used all of their sick time. And so we're hoping it's the right thing to do since we did talk to the county um, in December and it took up until January 26 for them to make a decision to take it to you guys. Um, so that's what we're asking. It would be grateful from our members um, that you do that to retro it to January 4th. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. The next speaker is a caller. If your number ends in 2915, you will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, supervisors. I am also concerned about the impending storm, and I'm very concerned that evacuees from the CZU area are not being allowed to bring their animals to the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds. What are these people supposed to do? The Graham Hill Showgrounds also are not available for animal evacuations because PG&E has leased it out 100%. A small number of spaces are available at Quail Hollow County Park, but that quickly filled. And now it, the equine evacuation group is scrambling for places to put animals for people so they can evacuate. If they can't evacuate with their animals, they may not. Now I wanna know why is the Santa Cruz County Fairground not available for these people? There is a 30-year contract between the fairgrounds and the county for times just like these. Why is that contract not being honored? I would like a response this morning because this is critical. I did write to Mr. Beaton and I copied uh, chair and vice chairs McPherson and Koenig on that. I really need an answer, as does the public. I also want to speak to consent agenda item 22 the uh, county fire cow fire budget the grand jury report urged you to cause cow fire to be more accountable this report this budget report is not eighty five thousand dollars for a steel building it is not explained at all in the documentation how will this serve county fire and those who are paying a new benefit assessment tax which needs to be adjusted by the way for the hundreds of homes in the county fire area who have that have, that burned but are still now thank you our next caller is carol bedorn you have two minutes to speak i am unmuting you please accept the unmute and start speaking the timer will begin when you start speaking good morning this is carol bjorn can you hear me yes awesome um, so in my past communication with the board about the governmental restrictions around stopping the spread of COVID, I've relied either on the law, the California Emergency Services Act, or science. Um, so far, relying on the law or science has not yielded any change in a lessening of the governmental restrictions that are still being imposed on the people of this county. And it's been more than 10 months after the declaration after the state of emergency by the governor, which was on March 4th, 2020. Um, so today I, I wanna change um, kind of my approach and just appeal to common sense. Um, and in that regard, I wanna speak to, um, to, to like what might be impending, I guess, as far as governmental re regulations. Um, and that is, you know, whether there's gonna be a mandatory uh, requirement for vaccination. So I, I'm curious, um, why would we need a vaccination for a disease that has a 99% recovery rate? And so I wanna, I'm just gonna repeat that so that everybody can think about that for a second. I feel like everyone is so caught up in the fear um, that they're not really thinking. Um, so here's the question again, why would we need a vaccination for a disease with a 99% recovery rate? Um, so with that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a caller whose number is private. If you have a private telephone number, you're being asked to unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Once you accept the unmuting, please start speaking and the timer will start. Private caller. Okay, we'll go to the next speaker. The next speaker, and I am sorry, I'm gonna massacre your name, is Conception Viz Vizcara. 
if your last name is Viscara, you will have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start speaking. Good morning. My name is Concepcion Viscara, and I am calling um, and this is to be the voice of the unrecognized essential workers that we have out in the fields doing hard labor and having to deal with this terrible pandemic. Um, with your permission, I would like to uh, have somebody read it and then be able to translate. Buenos días, mi nombre es Sandra Santos. Trabajo en el campo piscando fresas y vivo en Watsonville. Mientras estamos de acuerdo con la decisión del Estado ayer, 25 de enero del 2021, de extender la moratoria de los desalojos hasta el 30 de junio del 2021. Les pedimos a la Junta de Supervisores que nos ayuden a obtener los 2.6 mil millones en ayuda para inquilinos que ellos también prometieron. Ahora mismo, en la situación que estamos atravesando con COVID, no hay suficientes trabajos y necesitamos extender la moratoria a los desalojos. Desafortunadamente, no tenemos suficientes recursos para pagar el alquiler atrasado y el alquiler que sigue. En general, no tenemos suficientes salarios para cubrir todos nuestros gastos. Y desafortunadamente somos muchas personas que estamos pasando por lo mismo y es por eso que nos unimos para pedirles que se aseguren de que la ayuda para inquilinos llegue a las familias de bajos ingresos y que los salarios en este condado para los trabajadores sean salarios dignos para, los que, para lo que nuestra economía pueda mejorar para que podamos cubrir todas nuestras deudas. Como delegado del Consejo de Beneficios para Trabajadores de Santa Cruz, estoy aquí para pedir en nombre de los trabajadores agrícolas y otros trabajadores que nos defiendan. Gracias. In essence, um, although they agree with the eviction moratorium through January 30th, they're right now they're in a situation that they're going through with COVID. There's just not enough work, and they need uh, the to extend the moratorium on evictions at the end of this month. Unfortunately, we do not have enough resources to, to pay back rent and the rent that follows. In general, we don't have enough money. You can continue, Ms. Vizcara, you can continue speaking. You're getting the time for two speakers for the translation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we're struggling just to make ends meet and having to pay the rent back. We don't have enough salaries to cover all of our expenses, much less just to get internet for our kids um, and to feed them. There are many people who are going through the same thing, and that is why we are coming together to ask you to ensure the renters' aids gets to low-income families and that wages in this county for workers are living wages so that our economy can improve so we can cover all of our debts. As a delegate of the Santa Cruz Workers Benefit Council, I am here to ask on behalf of farm workers and other workers to advocate for us, please, and thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Jen Leveny. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you for discussing tiny homes, item number 12. My name is Jen Levini and I'm a real estate and housing lawyer. I live in the Live Oak Pleasure Point area and I'm the author of the tiny home law book called Building, Occupying, and Selling Tiny Homes Legally. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've been studying tiny homes as a housing solution for seven years. Um, what I'd like to do is describe how tiny homes are used by families as ADUs. Tiny homes on wheels are generally purchased for between 50 and $100,000 which means that if somebody finances them, they have an RV payment of approximately $350 per month. They're easy to set up in a family's backyard. Typically families, um, I don't know why I sound so nervous. Typically families will use them for their family use, for example, housing for their teenagers or as an additional bedroom for a couple of years. If you have teenagers, you understand. Um, then when their teenagers grow up and leave home, they rent out their uh, tiny home, creating additional housing for a few years, um, which also creates income for the homeowners. Then after retirement, uh, people downsize and move into the tiny homes in their backyard and rent out their larger family homes. This creates housing 
for families as well as income for working families. Tiny homes are a great solution for long-term problems, including housing and income for working families, which are both problems in our community. And I hope you support this and thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bernard. Bernard, you are being asked to unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning, uh, Chair Board. Uh, my name is Bernard Gomez. Uh, I'm here to speak on uh, consent item number 33. Um, and uh, my thing is uh, the probation officer has uh, requested for almost a double of the amount for the uh, for a county's continuing agreements list, right? And uh, so right now there's a big shift on uh, uh, with the Department of Juvenile Justice realignment SB 823, the closure of state facilities, right? Bringing our youth home that are out of the county. Um, and, you know, this uh, this item is, uh, is requesting to continue to send uh, youth out of county for uh, ranch camp purposes. Now, my concern is one is, you know, the COVID regulations, right? There's other counties uh, across the state that have stopped, you know, accepting uh, youth, you know, due to those regulations or to the danger of it. And however, Yuba County is still continuing. And I'm just seeking to, you know, put a stop to that uh, and, you know, keep our uh, our youth safe, right? There is a, a, a 4,000 a month expenditure to house each kid in that facility. So just thinking about what can we do with uh, with this money and reinvest it into this uh, this county's, uh, you know, it's considered a site county, right? When it comes to juvenile justice issues. Um, so, you know, we should, you know, maintain that, that, uh, our youth here at home, you know, uh, closer to their families, figure out new ways, uh, new opportunities, uh, you know, not just send them out for, you know, for continued confinement and uh, stress related, you know, just impacts that's gonna happen. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is a caller. If your telephone ends in 8045. You will have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Ellie Black. I've been a uh, speaker in public comment for many of year. And I'm wondering today if the council is aware of the article that has been circulating in our community now for several weeks um, discussing the community foundation that appears to be running most of the services and actions that have been taking place since the pandemic began. Uh, and there are some pretty strong claims in this article and myself and others have looked into it and it appears to be accurate. And if it is accurate, what does that mean as far as the citizen of this community being represented by the people who we choose in the elections to actually represent us? I'm wondering if this foundation has the best interest of Santa Cruz County residents at heart, or if this is something that is a bigger picture and we are just being used as pawns in larger schemes. I certainly hope that our elected officials are acting in the best, acting in the best interest of their constituents, but I really have to question a lot of these things in there. If these are being run by private foundations with anonymous donors, how do we know what the actual purpose is of all the actions that are being taken, as many have already spoken about the logistics and the common sense behind this lockdown that's killing small businesses and causing so many problems in our community based on a an illness that has a 99% recovery rate, if this really makes sense. So I don't expect a response as usual, but I would appreciate a response if that's possible. 
and I'm certain. The next caller is Stephen. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Stephen, if you're still on, please accept the unmute. Okay, we're going to move to the next person is a telephone caller. If your telephone number ends in 1401, you will have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, this is Marilyn Garrett. I'm excerpting uh, from Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s website, childrenshealthdefense.org. It's the topic, Big Pharma Views. Join me in supporting Dr. Paul Thomas, pediatrician, a hero defending children's health. Dr. Thomas is leading the battle to practice ethical health care and evidence-based medicine, honor informed consent, and stand up against medical coercion at every level. Please join me in supporting his efforts. And what they did was compare it from his practice in Portland, Oregon, integrated pediatrics vaccinated children with unvaccinated children. Vaccinated children, he states, appear to be significantly less healthy than the unvaccinated. It is time to state this fact. Vaccines are not safe. Vaccines are associated with significant acute and chronic health issues in children, including asthma, allergic rhinitis, breathing problems, behavior issues, ADHD, respiratory infection, ear pain, other infections, the list goes on. The article has graphs comparing what he's stating here. And he says, it is unethical to administer an experimental COVID-19 vaccine that has no long-term safety testing without setting up a system to compare. Thank you. And Chair McPherson, that is the last caller that we have for public comment. Okay, thank you. you know, before we uh, get to uh, the board members to comment, I think we can have a brief explanation about two of these items. Uh, the one on the animals, I know we we opened uh, a vaccination clinic there, and so it uh, changed some of the way we were doing things. Uh, Ms. Coburn, I think you can explain what, what is going on at the fairgrounds as far as animals and so forth. Yeah, thank you, Chair McPherson. Um, so it is correct that the animal shelter and equine evac are triaging the animals at Quail Hollow. Um, they're asking folks to come there. There are a number of sites that they're redirecting animals to one of which is the fairgrounds. The fairgrounds is serving as an overflow site for animal evacuations. The stables are open. Um, they've received about 30 horses at Quail Hollow and redirected them to a variety of ranches. Um, the shelter has also accepted some animals into its operations. So I would encourage people looking or needing help with evacuations to go to Quail Hollow or to contact the equine, equine evac hotline. And um, let me see if I can get you that number. Uh, the number to call is 831-708-8998. Okay, thank you. I, I hope that clarifies the situation. I know it's a, a moving target, so to speak, with the clinic that we set up there at uh, the fairgrounds as well. So. Thank you for that explanation. There's one other item that was brought up. I think we can get a quick explanation from our personnel director on item number 25 on the emergency uh, paid sick leave, Ajita Patel. Uh, 
Chair, give me one second and I will get Ajita on so she can speak to you. Very good. Ms. Patel, you can now speak. Good morning, Chair McPherson, members of the board. On item number 25, this is a letter to go ahead and extend the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. And it actually will bridge the gap for any employees who needed to be off for COVID related reasons from January 1 through the 26th. So as to Ms. Martinez's comments, it does serve the purpose that she was hoping for. Good. Thank you for clarifying that. And I appreciate uh, some quick responses to some inquiries we had. Uh, now I'll ask the, the board if they have any uh, comments on the consent agenda, items they might want to pull or just comments on any item. Uh, Supervisor Coney. Yes, uh, I'd like to request to withdraw item number 27 uh, from the consent agenda. Mr. Colligan has withdrawn his application to serve as my alternate on the RTC, and I'll be finding another candidate. Okay, so that will be withdrawn. Okay. Any other, anything else? Um, there's just a few comments. Um, item 26, I want to thank Tomiko Collins for volunteering to serve on the Civil Service Commission. Uh, and... Uh, item 30, Michael Lambach for volunteering to serve on the Commission on Disabilities. Uh, item number 32, the Auto Theft Reduction Task Force. Uh, I have heard from a, from a number of constituents that they're having their catalytic converters stolen, particularly off of Priuses. So I was glad to see uh, this item on the agenda, approving funding for the Auto Theft Reduction Task Force. Um, on item 41, approving the grant applications for the Farm Park and Chanticleer Park. Um, I've heard significant concerns from, from constituents about not just building new parks, but maintaining uh, our parks, making sure that we have sufficient budget to do that. Uh, the parks director uh, has assured me that um, the, we, we will have budget to maintain these parks once created. Um, so I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and on item 49, the right of way agreements or right of entry agreements that will enable um, access to the rail corridor uh, for our public work staff to begin pre-construction work. Uh, I uh, have had assurances from uh, the executive director of the RTC that that is really just is simply enabling necessary pre-construction work such as geotechnical analysis uh, and it would be necessary for whatever kind of infrastructure we build on the corridor. Right. Very good. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple brief items. On item 28, I'd like to thank uh, my colleague, Supervisor Coonerty, for taking the lead on this item. Uh, I'll let him speak more to it, but there's a lot of affordable housing funding coming from private trusts as well as um, from private companies over the hill, but uh, some of that isn't really making its way or none of it is making its way over to our side. And so this is a letter to try and encourage participation over to the Santa Cruz County area as well. On item 44, which is uh, funding regarding uh, Aptos Creek uh, Road, or specifically the uh, signalization, the synchronization of the of the lights between Trout Gulch and all the way to State Park. I just wanted to thank Public Works for, with everything else going on, uh, working with our office to get that application into the Air Board. Four hundred thousand is a uh, a lot of money to help that area out for synchronization. Uh, we've also been working uh, in the first district as well to improve some of that synchronization. It, these really can make a big difference in ensuring traffic flow. So thank you to Public Works. On, on item 49, I'm, I'm going to have to recuse uh, from that item. I live within 500 feet of the rail line, my principal residence, and so I have a financial conflict and we'll need to recuse from item 49. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple comments today. First on item number 20, I want to thank the Parks Department uh, for working to create some after school programs for parents who are, um, you know, trying to manage jobs and um, <clears throat> and teach in home schools and everything else. And so um, I'm hopeful that these efforts uh, relieve a little bit of burden and provide um, some good activity for kids who are in need of it. Item number 21, I want to thank, thank Sam Laforty and the Cannabis Licensing Office. Um, they have really stepped up uh, and done both a great job in approving permits and in doing enforcement. Um, and uh, it was a big challenge we put on their desk and I appreciate um, that they were able to respond so effectively and to the benefit of our community. 
And finally, on item number 28, as Supervisor Fred mentioned, um, you have some large companies that are um, trying to fund affordable housing uh, as, as you know, their industries have essentially have contributed to the, some of the affordability uh, challenges in our area. And I think it's important that, um, that we start the conversation by reminding them that uh, we are here, we are certainly impacted um, by the housing market in the Bay Area. And um, that, if we, that by leveraging some of these dollars for some existing projects, um, we're gonna be able to create some good affordable housing in our community. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Kaplan. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, a quick uh, note on uh, the fairgrounds for the uh, animals, uh, for the evacuation area. Uh, the, the fairgrounds is always open for uh, emergency situations. So I'm glad we cleared that up. Uh, PG&E, uh, that's correct. They are out there, they're uh, renting space for a staging area when they uh, are parking their trucks. They have many trucks out there, uh, but uh, they're still they're not uh, they're not in the area where the animals would go. Okay, uh, item twenty nine. I want to um, uh, welcome Vanessa Kiros Carter as the fourth district appointee to the Women's Commission, and. Uh, as uh, Supervisor Koenig uh, welcomed uh, the appointment of Michael Limbach as the fourth uh, district appointee to the Commission on Disabilities. And then I want to make a quick comment on item number 41. It's uh, good to see us that we are trying to get statewide uh, park development and community uh, revitalization programs. Uh, we're looking uh, for grants and uh, that'll really help out South County if we can get a little money down here in the South County also. And that's pretty much it. Uh, and I guess uh, we're gonna vote on everything. And is item 27 gonna be pulled, which would be the request of uh, Supervisor Koenig? Um, yes. It will be pulled. Okay. that will be great. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, Mr. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty mentioned the coronavirus funding on item number 20. Um, I want to thank all the departments for coordinating our efforts to spend the 20.7, 27.7 million dollars. Um, our, our response to the pandemic has been, uh, for our local people, have, it's been nothing short of amazing to me. Uh, we've got, we have different directions every 24 hours, it seems, from the feds, the state, and what's in and what's out. But the adjustment that people have made has been just fantastic. And I really want to thank everyone for making the effort, the extra effort, to make this work as best we can. Uh, I am concerned about the... Uh, the uncertainty of our future support. Uh, there's a strong agreement of, among some lawmakers to provide direct support for local governments. Uh, we hope that happens, but um, and, until we get uh, the funding to provide these services, it jeopardizes our responsibility as a county to respond. I, I would like to give some additional direction for the staff um, on the strategy for how to spend the estimated, I think it's 3.6 million in community support, uh, support and equity grants uh, portion for future funding. Uh, I think that should return to the board for discussion before the contracts are proposed. Uh, that, that would go along with item number 20. Um, the uh, supervisor on item number 21, also uh, Supervisor Coonerty uh, mentioned about the Cannabis Licensing Office. Um, I was glad to see that we made some changes last year that are bearing some fruit of a high number of licenses um, in the industry that we have now on record. Um, I think that, um, I do think though that we should revisit um, the uh, revenue projections we have for 2020, uh, this year, this next fiscal year, 21-22. Historically, we've missed the projections for licenses and fees. And I'd like to uh, perhaps uh, as part of the solution, make uh, revenue targets more realistic. Um, I just want to, say that I think we should give a closer look on our estimates of revenues because we haven't hit the targets 
and I'm not sure we we will um, if they're put too high again. So I, I'd just like to revisit that or certainly have more discussion on that when we uh, we can get a more predictable pattern over the next several years. Um, item number 28, uh, the affordable housing tech companies, it's all part of our housing crisis, uh, meeting our housing crisis here. We have a lot of people going over the hill or have, have been previously to uh, work in Silicon Valley uh, companies. Uh, I think um, it would be proper for them to consider uh, helping us. I think there's 30,000 cars a day that go over there on the commute period. Uh, so I think uh, the tech industry, uh, it, it's impacted the um, affordability and availability of our homes here in Santa Cruz County. So I would, uh, I really appreciate their taking a look at that and trying to get uh, the Silicon Valley to pay more attention to us. Um, item 42 on the donation to the parks. Uh, I wanna thank the community members of our own general services department for the contributions it made to our parks department. It's been a wonderful thing to see the investment in our programs and facilities at a time when they're needed most, people need to get out as much as they can. And uh, the item number 45, uh, again, this is on uh, resurfacing, road resurfacing projects, uh, public works for this. Uh, I wanna thank them for their update. And again, to the, me the, the voters who passed by more than two thirds measure D in 2016, we're making a lot of progress on the road repair section of uh, measure D. And uh, I think it's cr just critical that we, we uh, recognize that. Um, with that, I would um, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. And, and Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Palacios, does that include 53.1 or is that on the regular agenda then? That includes um, item 53.1. Okay, just to be clear. Okay. Uh, do we have the consent agenda as amended? I'll second that. Gurney and uh, Caput. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Supervisor Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Chair McPherson? Aye. Uh, consent agenda is approved as amended. Uh, now we'll go to the regular agenda, item number seven, for a uh, report, an update. We have an annual update from the uh, Metropolitan Transit District or Metro. Uh, Alex Clifford will make be making a presentation, but as a member of Metro, uh, as I have been for years, um, I just want to thank them for the cooperative effort that they have had with the Regional Transportation Commission in the recent years. It's been really great and very, very important and uh, really uh, some great results coming from that cooperative effort with the RTC. Uh, I'd also like to mention, I think Mr. Clifford will be saying something about it. Uh, we have two big projects that are in the uh, critical uh, final stages or getting to those final stages uh, of our community transportation uh, that'll meet our transportation as well as our climate uh, goals. Uh, one is the downtown station, uh, a rebuilding of the downtown station, as well as the uh, paratransit uh, center at the Soquel Avenue project across from uh, Dominican Hospital. Um, also bus on shoulder, which we'll be hearing about is critically important to help us in our commute times, uh, reducing those commute times. Um, and I really, um, our investment in our transit system is critical for many reasons, but not the least of which uh, are the climate factors that will be mentioned, I'm sure, and the equity goals. Uh, so I'm really happy to introduce uh, Mr. Alex Clifford, the CEO of the Transit District, to give us his annual report on uh, Santa Cruz Metro. Thank you much, uh, Chair McPherson and Board of Supervisors and CAO Palacios. I appreciate the invitation to present to you the state of Metro on an annual basis. Let me just ask, uh, am I gonna share my screen or will the uh, CTV people be bringing that up? You will be sharing your screen. Okay, let me go ahead and bring that up then. 
And you can see that. And then please do let me know if for some reason my slides are not advancing. I, I noticed something in a pre recent presentation where they weren't advancing. Um, so again, I'd like to present the state of Metro and, and uh, uh, integrate into that a COVID update. I'm sorry, if I could interrupt you before you start, if you could up in the left hand corner up top, hit the play and it, that way it will show each slide individually. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Does that look a little bit better? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I should be getting better at this by now. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit different presentation than, than normal, but this hasn't been a normal year in 2020 and flowing into 2021. And that hopefully that advanced. Um, so what does transit look like in this uh, hopefully upcoming post-COVID environment? The struggle is that nobody really knows. Um, we certainly have more questions than answers. There's not much history to draw from. Um, we know a little bit about challenges in economic recovery from the Great Recession, which generally lasted from about 2008 to 2014. Um, but certainly that was not the same as what we're experiencing with COVID, but it can tell, it can give, give, be an indicator of how long you can encounter an economic downturn. Um, in 2009, there was the swine flu that, that was a pandemic, but it never got this bad. So we didn't learn a lot from that, uh, nor did we from the 2005 avian flu, but certainly we did learn a little bit about uh, sanitizing techniques and we were able to draw from that experience um, soon after the new year in 2020 to actually begin preparing for the arrival of COVID in our county by starting to uh, bring aboard uh, disinfecting products. So what do we want to do? We want to always do the right thing, of course. You do, we do. We want to protect our customers and our employees. We want to take great care for the public trust, thoughtfulness, doing the right thing and trying to avoid costly mistakes. And as, as we have experienced since probably about March of 2020, uh, we think we're making some of the best decisions by participating in various state and national forums with fellow transit agency CEOs and various webinars to share our experiences, things that work, things that didn't work, and to help each other uh, integrate into our systems things that that other agencies have proven work and avoid costly mistakes. So Metro's initial initial strategy is sort of divided into three phases. One is to restore the public and customer confidence in a safe experience when riding our bus. Um, we're, in order to attract people back, we think we need to also look at adding value. And then we're spending a great deal of time thinking about what does the post-COVID transit service look like? So phase one, uh, restoring the public confidence. So we joined uh, APTA's health and safety pledge, and this is a pledge of certain things we will do to help keep our customers and our bus operators safe and certain expectations that we have of our customers. Uh, these uh, logos uh, and of our a representation of our commitment to safety have been placed on all of our buses and various collateral provided to us by APTA have also been placed on our buses. And then you've probably noticed, uh, as you see the buses going down the street, that these uh, a number of our advertising spaces on our buses, the sides and the rear back of the buses, have been replaced with these messages, deliberately, deliberately disinfecting, seriously sanitizing, and serious about safety. Again, we're trying to communicate a message to our customers, uh, come on back, um, our ridership is down, way down, and I'll talk about that in a few moments, but we really want to invite our riders back to the extent that they can come back and use the service, and we want them to feel good about it and how safe it will be. So with that, uh, one of the things that we did to protect our customers is we blocked off seats within our buses 
so that we can create physical distancing. And we also installed these clear plastic between row sneeze barriers. So if by chance you have somebody sitting behind you, um, you, will, you will have this barrier between them and potentially any airborne droplets. Uh, we did this on 100% of our buses. I know of no other transit agency across the nation that, that I've heard of yet that's done anything like this. There is no over-the-counter product, and uh, we have great talent in our maintenance, uh, maintenance group, and they were able to customize every bus, every one of these clear plastic um, between road dividers. In addition to that, we every night when the buses come into the facility to be fueled, we have, elect, we have somebody that has an electrostatic fogger, as you see on the left, that is spraying disinfectant throughout the bus, all the high touch surfaces, the seats, the seat backs, the stanchions. So every bus that comes through the facility to be fueled gets disinfected each night. On the right, you'll see that we've added hand sanitizer dispensers to all of our buses. So as the customer boards the bus, they can, they can dispense some hand sanitizer and uh, as, as they're paying their fare. And then we did something uh, a little bit different, sort of taking a page out of uh, uh, something that you have seen over the years, maybe in riding trains. Um, we hired some temporary employees and stationed them at our various transit centers, Watsonville, Capitola, Scotts Valley, and downtown Santa Cruz. And every time a bus comes into that facility, these folks jump on the bus. They have a bucket of hand san uh, uh, I'm sorry, a bucket of, of sanitizer. They dip a rag into it, and then they jump onto the bus, and they quickly sanitize all the high touch surfaces, the hand straps, the stanchions, the back of the seats, um, before that bus pulls out back into service. A bus may arrive, it may be there for a minute, it may be there for 10 minutes. So these folks have to work pretty fast. What does that do? Well, it tries to address the obvious. A bus every night gets sanitized, it leaves the shop the next morning sanitized, but the moment we start boarding passengers and they're touching surfaces, we can no longer make that claim. So the nice thing about our system is our, our buses all go through these various transit centers multiple times throughout the day. And so they're getting this additional disinfecting multiple times throughout the day. So it's a real nice added feature again to help our customers feel safe on our buses. And then for our bus operators, for a while after COVID hit in this county, in order to protect our bus operators and still be able to provide service, <clears throat> we discontinued front door boarding and we went free fares for a brief period of time while we took safety measures to protect our bus operators. So again, there are no over-the-counter products for something like this. Our talented people in our, our fleet maintenance facility constructed for every bus, all customized, these clear curtains and what a bus operator does is each time they pull up to a bus stop, uh, they deploy the curtain to protect themselves from airborne droplets that may be dispensed by customers boarding the bus. Um, and so once we completed this retrofit of 100% of our fleet, we started boarding again at the front door and collecting fares again. And then in addition, as you all know, um, the county mandated several months ago <coughs> that uh, people wear face coverings, and they were very specific in their order. The county health officer was very specific in her order that people waiting at bus stops, people boarding buses, people riding buses, and bus operators must wear a face covering. So we have we've put together these notices to our customers there on the buses, and we have empowered all of our bus operators to refuse rides if somebody tries to board that bus. Without a face covering, that operator can refuse the ride. If they get any pushback, that operator will radio dispatch. Dispatch will either send a supervisor or call, a, call the police or the sheriff to come help us out. So we're very serious about that. And then sometimes we experience customers who board with a face covering properly donned, but then um, when they're sitting in their seat, they take their face covering off. If the operator witnesses that, again, they're empowered to pull the bus over ask that person to properly wear their face covering. If they do not, they follow the same procedure I described earlier. So again, we're very serious about keeping our customers safe and our bus operators safe. 
So then along about October, we thought, well, you know, things, this is before Halloween, if you will. Uh, we thought things were getting uh, significantly better. Remember, our, our county moved to um, through the, the state uh, recovery color coding to one of the better designations. And so we put together a big press event and said, hey, you know, come on back. Look at all the things that we've done. I, we celebrated the things that I've described to you today. Come on back, ride the bus. And, you know, if, you, if your job has returned and you need to get to work, um, you need our service, ride our bus. If you need to go to the grocery store, the doctor's appointment, ride our bus. We're providing you a safe experience. So then phase two added value, which is an overlapping phase, which we are in today. Um, the talk today, no matter where you are at, is contactless, touchless, uh, anything and everything. And so we're looking at that too. Now, we've always been contactless, touchless, to the extent that our customers have used our smart card. They can load value on that smart card, whether that be cash or transit passes, and, and they can bring it near the fare box and, and it'll uh, electronically uh, debit that card or acknowledge that it has a fare on it. Um, so we've always had that. So we've made a big push to our customers. Please, to the extent you can, move away from paper fare media, cash and coin, move to contactless, touchless. Uh, in addition to that, in October, we launched our first um, smartphone application, the Splash Pass, and we're migrating customers system-wide. Originally, that was going to be a pilot project for just Highway 17, but because of COVID, we, had, we advanced that to a system-wide launch. We're also investigating a proposal we hope to bring to our board uh, sometime soon to expand Wi-Fi. We have Wi-Fi today available to our customers on Highway 17 commuter buses, but we do not on the rest of the fixed route system. We think it would be great added value to extend that. Um, the new technology for the automated vehicle location system that we're currently installing on our buses has that feature to be turned on. There is a cost. We will ask the board if they will approve that as soon as we accept that automated vehicle location product uh, um, being installed on our buses. In addition to that, <clears throat> early this year, we hope to bring a proposal to the board to install automatic passenger counters on our buses. Now, these, you know, before COVID were something that we were thinking about because we like data. We like to be able to plan a system around data. We don't like anecdotal planning. And passenger counters tell us a lot about where people get on and off, and we can better plan our service. The neat feature about this with the smartphone application is that once we launch this, if the board approves it, um, the customer will be able to see on their smartphone application how many people are on that approaching bus. And if they are uncomfortable with the number of people on that approaching bus, then when the bus arrives, they can wave it on by and wait for the next bus. We're giving the customer the opportunity to make a decision on their own about their comfort level relative to the number of people on that bus. Um, the board has approved redesign of our bus stops. They're gonna get much smarter and much nicer looking. We've also added uh, kiosks at Watsonville and Santa Cruz Transit Centers. Since we've closed down our customer service, customer facing window at those two locations because of COVID, we, we added this feature so that people can, in effect, push a button, much, much like, if you will, a ring doorbell, uh, and it has a camera and the customer service will see that customer and be able to interact in real time with that customer. And then we talked about automatic vehicle location, predictive arrival that's currently in the process of being installed on our buses. Okay, going on to the next slide. So phase three is the post COVID and, and again, we're spending a lot of time thinking about what that looks like. <clears throat> we're evaluating, uh, actually, we, we brought a proposal to the board this month for on-demand service um, that's been delayed to be further discussed at the board's meeting in February. Uh, but that would create basically uh, six microtransit districts um, near existing fixed routes in which we would do a kind of a door-to-door -door service. This is a pilot project we're proposing. And then as much as financially feasible, we're trying to restore service levels to pre-COVID levels. This is important. When the customers need to use our service, when their job returns, 
or they need to go to the doctor, dentist, grocery store. That service needs to be there for them. If it is not, if we, if we cut service too much and it's not there, they'll find other ways to do their business. Or they may, they may actually, if they're transit dependent and, and we're not available, they may not have a job to go back to because they can't get to the job. So it's important for us to have the service there when they need us as opposed to the, the alternate philosophy, which is wait until the demand is there and then put the service there. We don't agree with that. We think it needs to be there, even if we're running some empty buses for, for a while while we come through the phases of recovery. Um, customers have told us through a post-COVID survey that, that as, as they return, they expect better frequency on certain routes. So we're paying attention to analyzing that. We need to do better with on-time performance. To date, on-time performance has been very antidotal, some minor sampling with a human being going out there and sampling uh, ridership on buses uh, and also our on-time performance on buses. Um, when we get these two products that I talked to you about earlier, the automatic vehicle location and the passenger counters, we'll be able to move into an environment where we plan our service and hold our service accountable by real data. That'll allow us between service changes to better plan um, route timing and, and produce a bus service that uh, operates more on time. Customers demand that. We're going to do better in that respect. Um, we're thinking, we're rethinking the role and functionality and layout of transit centers. Uh, don't have an answer there yet, but we're rethinking that. Um, we're also rethinking the future of ticket vending machines, uh, paper fare media, cash and coins. And then as, as Supervi Supervisor McPherson alluded to earlier, we think bus on shoulder is a real nice added value for our customers, um, working closely with the RTC to get that in place in a couple of years. And that hopefully will allow us to engage some new express service. Maybe we'll call it bus rapid transit, BRT, who knows, um, to get passengers, customers from South County to North County to work in a very quicker way. I talked a little bit earlier about ridership being down. It is, it is down significantly. Uh, this chart shows that ridership uh, through about uh, middle of, um, of December. And it, it, as you can tell, we've gone through a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, and when the governor issued the stay home order, ridership plummeted again. Now, in the last couple of weeks, ridership has started to come back up a little bit. Um, we hope that that will continue, but it is it is far and away um, below what it should be. For example, on this slide, it shows that it's at about fourteen thousand trips in a, in that particular week in December, um, and that same time last year, it should have been at about fifty three thousand trips. So we are way off our mark, but still, we like to see this going in the right direction. The yellow line simply tells you how many people we're passing up. Because we capacity constrain our buses, we only allow, for example, 15 people maximum on a, on a 40 foot bus. That results in us having to pass people up occasionally because our bus is full. So we track that so that we can make adjustments in our service as needed should we notice that we're passing up um, more people. Um, there are too many people. Um, we prefer to pass up nobody, quite frankly. So moving on to the state of our budget a little bit briefly, a couple of notes there. As of December 31st, like you, our revenues are down. In our case, we're down about 1.3 million in revenues. That certainly is dominated by passenger fares. Uh, since our ridership is down about 85%, there too means your, your revenues are gonna be down. Uh, also, we're not receiving uh, the payments we would have otherwise received from UCSC, for example, because their students are not doing in-person classes and they don't need the level of service they normally have. Now, the good news is we've been managing uh, with a microscope our expenses, and we've been able to manage our expenses down, saving about $3.2 million through the first half of our fiscal year. So net-net, we're at a favorable $1.8 million. We need to continue to do that because uh, we don't know how long it's going to take to recover from what's going on right now. Now, the, the state of the congressional funding, uh, you, you all know that the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 was signed by the president. It's an omnibus bill. That simply means multiple things are going on, budget, 
Corona relief, other things are going on all at the same time and they all pass uh, with one vote and they all get signed by one signature. Within that omnibus bill, there was the Emergency Corona Relief Act that now has another term. Congress is really good at starting out with various terms and abbreviations and acronyms and then later on they end up changing it and they did it again today. And so the, the newest acronym or abbreviation is CRSAA, C-R-R-S-A-A. -A. Um, and then there was also the federal budget that was adopted. Now those both have important things to us which I'll tell you about here shortly. So in the COVID stimulus dollars, what was at the time when this slide was drafted called the ECRA, um, and we, we would be allocated uh, through their formula programs. At this time, we thought 12 million. Actually, we know that number a little better today. It's closer to about 13.5 million. This is similar to the CARES Act. In the CARES Act, we were allocated transit emergency funding to the tune of about $20 million. So these two funds combined become a reserve that we will use to try to survive the, the economic downturn. And we're desperately trying to do everything possible to avoid furloughs and layoffs at our organization. So far, we have not had to do that, only because Congress stepped up in the CARES Act and now in this latest a corona relief uh, allocation, specifically to help transit survive and, and to help us avoid layoffs and furloughs. Uh, so we've taken that to heart. And what will happen is in the coming months, as we go through the economic roller coaster ride, in those months in which we don't have enough revenues to pay all our bills, we'll draw down on these funds to bridge that gap in order to avoid layoffs and furloughs and major service cuts. We hope that by the time we run out of this money, that the economy has recovered and things are back to some semblance of post of pre-COVID uh, funding and ridership and, and expenses, but we don't know. And to that end, we will also hope that the federal government will monitor this co closely and create additional corona relief emergency funding for us. And then in the budget side, we have something called uh, our, our transit authorization um, that's included in the budget. Um, we also receive some money annually because we operate compressed natural gas buses. It's an alternative fuel tax credit. It's an extender which requires Congress to renew it annually. That gives us about $300,000 that we'll use in our capital program. And then the, the FAST Act, which is again, our transit authorization funds uh, in law, uh, appropriates in law, a, a certain baseline of funding for transit agencies across the nation. And in the last couple of years, including in 2021 funding cycle, Congress plussed up. They gave us more than the minimum, which was 198 million nationwide. To our agency, that'll be about 205,000 additional dollars. And then they also did plus ups in the, in the uh, capital programs, bus and bus facilities and LONO. In 2016, we got a LONO uh, grant to buy three uh, electric buses, and we hope to go for a LONO grant probably in 2022 or 2023. Um, this year, we'll be going for a bus and bus facilities grant to build a new paratransit facility over near Dominican. So this plus up should help better our chances, we hope, of, uh, of receiving uh, that grant. And then I'd just like to close with our slide. All Santa Cruz Metro dedicated employees are frontline heroes delivering essential services. Mr. Chair, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Sorry, Mr. Chair, you're muted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clifford, for that uh, detailed explanation. Uh, transportation is a critical component of our lifestyle around here, and uh, uh, you've been able to adjust to a 85% downturn in uh, ridership through no fault of Metro's uh, doing, but uh, I, along with uh, Supervisor Koenig, do sit on the Metro Board of Directors. Uh, do I have any questions from, uh, the Met, uh, from the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Koenig? <clears throat> Uh, no questions. I just wanted to thank Director Clifford for the presentation and, and say I'm particularly excited about the automatic passenger counters uh, and vehicle locators. I think those 
uh, having that additional data is going to be crucial for, as you said, bringing back the service in a way that is efficient as possible and uh, meets the demands of customers as best as possible. So really excited to see those technological updates. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Friend, any comments? Uh, no, Chair, I don't, I don't have any questions. My, I just have a, a brief comment. Thank you, Mr. Clifford, as always, for this presentation. And um, I know that the district has considered sort of on-demand on and ride-sharing options previously. And so I do look forward to hearing more about that as, as the time moves on. And one thing that the district may want to may want to consider is, is actually doing sort of an annual state of the district, uh, the Metro district uh, kind of presentation. You do have uh, events. I know that you invite everybody to, but maybe this this kind of presentation seems like it could be uh, done well as a metro sort of countywide thing where you invite all the various city councils and stuff to participate in. So thank you. Good. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, any questions, comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have any questions. Uh, I agree with Supervisor Coning about the importance of the real-time data and the efficiencies and you know better quality of service that we'll be able to provide our riders. Um, and so I look forward to, to seeing that come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Supervisor Caput, any comments? Yeah, th thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Clifford for the uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I, I know on the 91X, I've used that before. Uh, is, is that still running? Yeah, I, I know when, uh, in the summer, sometimes it's not running because Cabrillo's not in session, but uh, right now with uh, Cabrillo's enrollment down and ridership down all over, is 91X still uh, running at all? It is still running. We've made some adjustments to service, obviously, uh, to try to respond to what level of service we can provide uh, a, and match that to where the riders are. But yeah, we're, we're still getting uh, a decent amount of South County to North County uh, commutes. You bet, thanks, thank you. Okay, I, I just like to close and saying, um, you know, thank you uh, from the board comments. Thank you for your efforts in adjusting to these crises that we faced uh, from coronavirus to fires to whatever it may be. Uh, Thank you. I think uh, Metro is uh, ready to serve and do a better service in the future when we get back on track uh, with reality or what it used to be like. So thank you very much. Uh, are there any comments from the public? Yes, Chair. We have some speakers that are wanting to talk. The first person is actually, if before we call them, if you will give me a second, I will share my screen and put the timer up. Okay, our first speaker is Monica McGuire. You have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Hello, it's Monica McGuire. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Clifford, I, I'm wondering, would you please right now give full answers to the questions often asked throughout the year by the public, even if you've done them that at other meetings, the public is not present at every meeting. And one of the ones that has come up a lot this year is, are you employing or buying smaller vehicles for the low ridership? And um, can you give any details about that choice, however you have made it, since I know that question has been brought up quite a bit. Um, and the adjunct need, of course, there is that smaller buses could actually allow for the rider and driver hours um, as options where they would go mask free, that you could offer mask free hours for the full load of the population that would like that. Um, anyone who would actually ask the public our opinion would find out that a full third of the um, people who are wearing masks at work already suddenly uh, six to eight hours a day and don't want to be wearing it the extra um, plus uh, all the people who would be riding buses but cannot now because we can't wear masks and it's better if you offer the ability for people who can't wear masks to be matched up with drivers who can't wear masks and or are willing to not wear them because of knowing that it's so much healthier to exchange healthy bacteria and we've already tested our bodies so extensively with less touch, less shared breathing, less everything 
so that they'd be better off if they had that option as well. So will you please answer those questions and or put it on the agenda for a future meeting as is supposed to happen when public asks questions like this. Thank you so much. We appreciate hearing. Hey, Mr. Mr. Clifford, by my, uh, if we could answer, if you could answer those questions at the next Metro board meeting, I think that'd be the, the proper place to do it. Uh, next caller, please. Thank you. Next caller is um, a person who's calling in on the telephone. Your number is private, so I can't call your number out. If you have a private number and you are wanting to speak, now is your time. You have two minutes. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Hello, uh, this is Marilyn Garrett. I used to ride the bus a lot. Now that uh, we've been conditioned to think everyone's a biohazard and you have to be a certain distance apart, uh, people are afraid to go out. I, what's happening, I think it's pretty obvious, is that anything that benefits the, the public uh, is and small businesses are being destroyed by these policies. And when you have policies of lockdown and restrictions, this is the predictable consequence, destruction and destruction of any type of representative government. Uh, that's where we're heading. Also, uh, when I heard Mr. Clifford talk about automated counter sets putting people out of work real-time data i learned that this automatic vehicle location involves uh, frequencies of microwaves connecting to the 4g verizon antennas that Mm, Sack friend uh, saw that there were 13 of these in a square mile in Aptos. So as the bus goes along, the frequencies that are dangerous, biologically harmful, are uh, kicking in. And this uh, people on computers and Wi-Fi is more and more damaging microwave radiation. So. Uh, it's very disturbing, very unhealthy, and while you ooh and ah over real-time data and vehicle location, you're... Thank you. The next person is also a caller. If your number ends in 2915, you have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just point out that the paid ads on the sides of buses was a source of, of revenue for Metro. And I really think that, that the ad should be reinstated to bring in money for Metro. People really aren't going to pay attention to a sign on a bus saying it's safe. What they really need to hear is some of this information that Mr. Clifford has put out, like the people who jump on and, and quickly sanitize things. That's what will build confidence and trust in um, building up the ridership. So I encourage those paid ads to come back to help with the budget problems. I also uh, am opposed to putting uh, Wi-Fi onto the fixed route system. There are many people who, like Ms. Garrett and myself, are EMF sensitive. There are many people in this community that are and that would use the bus but would not use the bus if there's Wi-Fi fixed on the bus. As Ms. Garrett said, there are plenty of, of nodes along the routes where people can and do use their um, Wi-Fi devices. So please do not do that. That is a violation of the American Disabilities Act, and I am opposed to doing it. Regarding full buses having to pass up passengers, when Metro is aware of that, why not put in a follow-up bus so that those people who are being passed up will, within five minutes, ten minutes, get another bus coming along with assurance. That will also increase your ridership because if people are passed up repeatedly, they're going to stop trying to use the bus. I also want to take uh, 
uh, exception to your claim that you did not lay off anyone. You did, in fact, lay off Mr. John Dougherty because of... Thank you. And Chair McPherson, that is the last uh, public comment. Okay, I don't think we need any um, any action on this. Uh, the next, I'd like to just mention that the next board, board meeting of uh, Metro is Friday, February 26th at 9 a.m. and it'll be a virtual meeting. So um, it's uh, February 26th at 9 a.m. if people have any questions that they might want to bring to Metro. Again, Mr. Clifford, thank you for your presentation and for Metro's adjustment to uh, the ongoing circumstances that we have. Uh, we will now go on to item number eight. Um, that is a public hearing uh, to, uh, let's see, let me see, I get my notes here all spread all over the place. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, what do I do with that? I, okay. This is a public hearing to consider accepting the Coastal Commission modifications, ordinance number 5345 relating to county code section 1310.694 regarding vacation rentals, adopt a resolution accepting the commission's modifications, adopt ordinance based on the modifications and take other actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. We have a resolution of acceptance of the triple C amendments to 1310-6494, D2A and exhibit A ordinance amending SCCC 1310-694 with CCC modifications, amendments to 1310-694 CCC modification. There's a strikeout underline. The CCC report, staff report, the CCC staff, staff report addendum, and the CC uh, hearing correspondence. Uh, it's included in the county letter. Uh, do we have a presentation or would like to open the public hearing and who will be presenting? Good morning, Chair McPherson. This is oh, Jocelyn, Jocelyn Drake. Jocelyn, yes, thank you. Good morning. It sounds like you can hear me. Yes, we can. Um, thank you. Great. Good morning. Good morning, Chair McPherson and Supervisors. I'm Jocelyn Drake, the Principal Planner with the Planning Department. Um, this morning's hearing is to request that the Board accept the California Coastal Commission's modifications to the County's recently passed Ordinance on Vacation Rentals. As you'll recall, back on September 1st, 2020, the board passed ordinance 5345, amending the vacation rental provisions in chapter 1310 of the Santa Cruz County Code. And those amendments adopted by the board include, included lowering the caps in the designated areas and strengthening the code enforcement provisions. Chapter uh, County Code Chapter 1310 implements the county's local coastal program and therefore the amendments must be approved by the Coastal Commission. So just recently on January 13th, 2021, the Coastal Commission um, held a public hearing and they agreed that the amendments are in conformance with the county's local coastal program and they do implement the uh, California uh, Coastal Act. However, they took exception to one proposed amendment. Uh, the commission, the, Cal uh, the Coastal Commission found that the num numerical cap adopted by the board for the Live Oak designated area, or also known as the LODA, does not reflect the current stabilized market in that the board adopted cap reduced the number of permits permitted in the LODA below the number of permits currently issued in the LODA. So as the board may recall, the, the adopted cap by the board was 200. 220 vacation rentals and 18 hosted rentals for a total of 238 short-term rental permits. The Coastal Commission reviewed uh, that proposed cap and they felt that a revised cap of 262 vacation rental permits and 18 hosted rental permits for, uh, for a total of 280 short-term rental permits was more appropriate. Um, they felt this because the cap uh, the amended cap, the revised cap of 280, reflects the current number of permits issued in the LODA. They also included an additional nine permit allocations for, to allow for processing of applications that were placed on hold due to the moratorium last summer. So I just wanted to point out that this numerical cap, even revised at 280, would still allow fewer permits than the existing percentage-based cap that is currently in effect in the LODA. 
that 15% that we started with and as reflected in the current code. Um, so that is the recommendation. And so staff is asking that the board conduct a public hearing and accept these modifications with passage of a resolution transmitting the acceptance to the Coastal Commission and a new ordinance that incorporates these changes, which is the one change that I mentioned, the change to the cap and the loda. As required by law, acceptance of the amendments will return to the Coastal Commission for approval before going into effect. And I'm available to answer any questions. And we also have the planning director with us here today as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn, for that presentation. Um, are there any comments from the board before we open the public hearing? Uh, I see any hand, don't see any hands raised. Okay, we will open this to the public. Are there any comments uh, from the public? Yes, Chair, it looks like we do have a couple of comments. If you give me one second, I will share my screen. Okay. I apologize. Okay, our first person to speak is Joe Hall. You are being requested to be unmuted. You will have two minutes to speak. Once you start, the timer will begin when you start. Hello and good morning. Uh, my name is Joe Hall. I'm a resident of Live Oak, referred to in your staff report as the LODA. Uh, thank you for approving the County Vacation Rental Ordinance nine years ago. It's made a big change in our neighborhood. And most recently, the step, the board took a big step forward to reduce the cap on vacation rentals. We've had nine years of experience and we know what vacation rentals do in our neighborhood. What the cap recognized was the time it takes to enforce permit conditions on vacation rentals in residential neighborhoods. They are basically businesses and their goal is to maximize return while neighborhoods goal is for people to live in. One comment from the Coastal Commission staff I thought was interesting. It was mentioned that the market for vacation rentals is stabilized. Well, the reason it's stabilized was the county passed the vacation rental ordinance. Otherwise, there'd be a lot more in our neighborhood. The ordinance succeeded in that respect. During the discussion by the Coastal Commission members, an idea was put forth by a member of the commission. And that idea was that instead of lowering the number, maybe shift more of them into hosted vacation rentals, which are managed by the owners and we've had very few problems with. I would hope your board would direct the planning department to consider a future amendment to the vacation rental ordinance to bring forth a new proposed cap of 220, which you previously approved and increase the number of hosted vacation rentals by a similar number. This allows the Coastal Commission access, but helps neighborhoods have uh, less party houses because many of the bigger homes, that's what they end up. There's really no other way to describe it. So anyhow, in closing, I would hope you would continue to look at putting a numerical cap that's lower. You can enforce it, people can live with it. We're not asking to do away with it. We're asking to something that can be more successfully managed in the neighborhoods. Thank you so much and thank you for considering this. Thank you. Thank you. The next um, person to speak is a telephone caller. If your number ends in 2915, you have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was quite surprised to see that the Coastal Commission would um, demand a higher number of housing stock be taken out of, be removed from housing stock and put into um, essentially a business, a commercial business within the residential area. I, I, I oppose this in all areas, but I'm curious why they singled out the Live Oak area, which had a cap, but the Davenport area also has a lower number. Why was that, that area not addressed? Um, uh, this makes no sense to me, and I, I support what Mr. Hall said, that uh, using the hosted rental system would provide 
places for people to stay. We have plenty of hotels, even though many of them have been uh, leased to the county for providing COVID homeless shelter, but there are plenty of hotels. And that's what needs to be supported with transit on occupancy tax taxes in commercial areas and not bringing these party houses to our neighborhoods. So um, please, I, I hope you do not support this because I think it's unacceptable and does a disservice to the Live Oak area. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Carol Behorn. I apologize. Bajorn? 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 <laughs> I'm going to get your name right sooner or later. You will have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. The timer will start when you start. Uh, yes, thank you. This is Carol Bjorn. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I want to echo the comments of Joe and Becky. Um, I am very surprised that the Postal Commission came in with this higher number. And I agree. I think those uh, rental units should be um, more evenly distributed throughout other areas, not just concentrated in one area. Um, and, uh, and the bigger issue here too is um, the Coastal Commission is an unelected body and they're essentially changing an ordinance. So um, I think we need to look really hard at that and make sure that the people of Santa Cruz that are paying the property taxes that have elected the Board of Supervisors that you all um, represent us, even in the face of an unelected body such as the Coastal Commission. So that would be my uh, recommendation or encouragement to you all is to really think about what your role is and how you are elected. You represent the people. Um, the Coastal Commission was not elected. And so if, we, if you need to stand up for the people, I would highly encourage you to do that. I yield, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Crystal. You will have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Uh, my name is Crystal Cadillas. I'm a representative of Turnkey Vacation Rentals, and I actually just have a question for the board. Um, thank you for the presentation, and I was just hoping to get an idea. I know timelines are hard to pin down. I just have owners on my end that I represent waiting for some type of solution. So should this move forward today, hypothetically, what can we see in timeline as far as permits being reissued, assuming they're in a zone that's not capped? Okay, thank you. And Chair, that is the last public comment we have on this item. Okay, uh, Jocelyn, I don't know if there were some questions that you might be able to answer there. Um, yeah. Um, the question that I noted was why the um, cap was recommended to be raised in the LODA by the California Coastal Commission, but not in the other two designated districts, um, which are um, the Salsda and the DASDA, Davenport and uh, the Seacliff Aptos area. And the reason why is because uh, back um, last summer and fall, when the board adopted revised caps in the designated areas, the caps, um, the new lowered caps, they were all, they've all been lowered over what the uh, percentage rate um, cap is that's currently reflected in the um, vacation rental ordinance is. However, in the DASDA and in the uh, SOSDA, um, the caps were lowered to reflect the existing number of permits in those designated areas. In the LODA, the Live Oak area, the cap was actually lowered below the number of existing permits in the LODA. So right now, as of a month ago when um, this went to the Coastal Commission or a few weeks ago, um, the uh, we had 253 uh, permits, vacation rental permits issued in the LODA. So that is um, significantly higher than the 220 cap that the board adopted. And that was that was intentional um, to, to, um, to the, with the idea being that over time through attrition as um, vacation rental permits were um, relinquished and, and weren't renewed or properties changed ownership that we would actually remove um, 
a significant number of permits out of the pool of permit availability. And that is what the Coastal Commission had an issue with is they felt that the current number of permits that are out there reflects the current stabilized market and we should cap it at status quo. Okay, I think that answers most of the questions uh, that were, um, is there any other, there are no other comments from the public? Um, I will bring it back to the board for consideration. Uh, I, I want to um, repeat one of the questions, uh, another question raised by the public which I've received a number of times, which is, uh, if the board moves forward with this action uh, as recommended today, what happens to the vacation rental moratorium? Uh, the moratorium is lifted when the new ordinance goes into effect. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board members? Supervisor McPherson, I'll make some brief comments. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I, I think it's important to kind of reflect a little bit on the history here. Um, as Mr. Hall noted, and he was a, a leader in our community for bringing this forward almost 10 years ago, but the county went from a completely unregulated vacation rental market to a very, very, very controversial initial regulation of the market to an expansion of those regulations to where we are today. And during that time, the Coastal Commission had made it very clear. Initially, they expressed concerns of any caps at all. After extensive negotiation, uh, there was agreement on these percentage caps, which, by the way, um, were still very controversial, both with uh, some of the local property management associations and the Coastal Commission. But this was what the agreed upon number was. Uh, there were some supervisors like myself that thought that those numbers were still too high. As time went on, uh, we continued to have two things happen. One, a conversion of homes that were used as long-term rentals, uh, both into vacation rentals and hosted rentals. And, and by the way, um, uh, planning department did do a survey of hosted rental owners and asked them how many had had long-term rentals before the conversion. And, and about one in five had said they had done a conversion. So there's an unequivocal, I think that's an under-reporting because that's a self-reporting. There's an unequivocal relationship between hosted rentals and the loss of affordable housing long-term stock. There's an unequivocal relationship between whole home rentals and the loss of long-term uh, rental stock in our community. So the board decided um, that we wanted to create additional regulations and restrictions. Additionally, it was very hard to revoke permits when there were problematic actors, which is disproportionately within Supervisor Koenig's district and my district, which are people that have had party homes. And the planning department uh, really is hamstrung uh, under the current guidelines for revoca re re revocation of permits. There really isn't clarity on a process that enumerates how to revoke. What's proposed today and what the board approved uh, are by far the strongest uh, additional regulations that have been proposed since the creation of the ordinance nine years ago. It creates a very strong set of guidelines for revocation and expectation of behavior of those that own these properties. It caps it at a number that is significantly below what could still happen uh, should the percentage caps continue to exist. I mean, for that matter, by a few hundred when all said and done, at least within the first and second district of what could potentially grow in the 15% uh, to 20% numbers. And so I think that, and the Coastal Commission made it clear when our board took action back in September based on community requests to lower the number beyond what is even currently uh, existent in the first district that they would not support such an action. I mean, they, they were unequivocal about this. And so it really wasn't surprising that a couple of weeks ago, they took the action that they had promised that they would take, which is that they didn't wanna see a reduction. The fact that they were even willing to, to meet us uh, to see the reduction of the cap is where it is below a number that they had originally approved on a percentage that was below where they were comfortable being, I felt, uh, is a good sign of them working with us on this issue. Um, I would be concerned, by the way, of this compromise proposal of allowing for a growth in hosted rentals because we know for a fact that it reduces uh, the affordable housing stock and many of those are used for long-term rentals. I recognize that they may be less problematic than the whole home rentals, uh, but there's also that other trade-off of the loss of affordable housing. So uh, that's a long, I, I, I apologize for the long speech. It's a long way of me just giving the history. I think it's important for us to recognize we've come a long way from unregulated to regulated, and this is a strong, strong uh, ordinance that's before us. And as such, 
I'll move the recommended actions. I have a second. I'll, I'll second that. Any, com any other further comments? I really appreciate your summary, Mr. Friend, who's right on to really the reality of it all and what has taken place. Uh, these are as strict, I guess you would say, as, as we, could, uh, we could have hoped for, and even more so than what the commission the Coastal Commission called for initially. So uh, I appreciate your overall uh, explanation of the process. Mr. Cooter, did you have a comment uh, too, or Mr. No, I, I, I share your appreciation of Supervisor Friend's summary and issues. And, you know, this is like many of the issues we work on, it's a balance of competing interests. And then it's also a balance of uh, competing regulatory bodies. There's us and the Coastal Commission. Uh, who have different mandates and different roles and responsibilities. And, you know, um, somewhere, somewhere in there tends to be the compromise. And I also appreciate the fact that staff has continued uh, to work with us to, and the community to iterate and improve on this uh, ordinance to continue to address changing market conditions and changing uses and changing impacts. Okay, thank you. I do not see any other further comments. Uh, I, oh, excuse I, me, Mr. Uh, excuse Supervisor me. Coleman. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just had uh, one question, um, which is, you know, I d it doesn't sound today like there's any support for sending a revised ordinance back to the Coastal Commission. Um, but I did want, uh, you know, just clarification, if if that were to happen, what would the process even be? And what kind of delays would we see in the implementation of any ordinance? Um, I... I would have to check in with um, with the planning director to see if she has any idea of how, what that would what that would result in as far as delays. If you adopted a revised ordinance and we had to go back to the Coastal Commission, um, Kathy, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Um, what I would anticipate is that the Coastal Commission would request some. Um, deeper level of market analysis of the visitor accommodation industry and you know they would continue to have concerns about the market and overall access of um, visitors to the coast to find appropriate accommodations um, at times the coastal commission i, I know not all vacation rentals are um, considered you know, lower priced than hotels, but some are. And in the past, the Coastal Commission have considered that, you know, uh, availability to increase the spectrum of cost uh, accessibility to members of the public. So I think that it would um, likely be, I mean, this, this ordinance, this effort has taken about a year. And I think if we were to start over and, and do another one, it would take, you know, six to nine months, most likely. Got it. Thank you. Uh, one other question, which um, you know, I've heard a lot of concerns about um, enforcement to date. Um, you know, how many vacation rentals so far, um, you know, up to this point under the old ordinance have uh, have been shut down for illegal conduct in the county, um, either because they violated the terms of an existing permit that they had, or never actually got a permit. Um, I don't have the figures on how many um, code enforcement cases we've had related to folks uh, operating uh, rentals without the benefit of a permit um, offhand. Um, when we do cite somebody who is operating without a permit, the resolution is to apply for a permit and we've had permit availability up until the moratorium. So typically people resolve that particular issue by getting a permit. Um, since I've been here the past four years, I'm not aware of us revoking a permit. However, we have heavily negotiated with permit holders to rectify the issues that, um, that have come to, to our attention because we haven't had the strongest uh, violation um, policies and regulations in the ordinance. Um, we've kind of, you know, used sort of our softer skills to resolve as many issues as possible. Of course, there's the higher level issues that the sheriff takes care of, you know, noise violations and he'll, they'll issue tickets and things like that. But for things that are, are in our realm, 
Uh, we've usually been pretty successful, I would say, with the majority of, or of uh, folks out there who have been bad actors on sort of a more mid-level through, um, through, you know, talking to them, medi uh, mediation, things like that. But with the revised ordinance, as you know, um, we have some very strong language in our violation section, which will give us a, a lot more ability, gr greater ability to um, to find um, a reason to cite a, a rental operator for a significant violation. And we've laid out a process where um, two significant violations will require public hearing. Uh, for potential revocation and also will be grounds for denial of a renewal of an application. Um, so I think that uh, with these current revisions, you'll see a lot more um, enforceability um, moving forward. Great, thank you, Ms. Drake. Um, I'll just comment that, you know, of course it's it's challenging uh, coming in here. And of course the only revision that the coast or, or amendment the Coastal Commission has sent back uh, is in the district that I represent. Um, and I feel like I'm really arriving at uh, this point in the policy making process where the, the cake ha has just come out of the oven, it's baked. <laughs> um, so, you know, and and I think, you know, we've, I know this has been a process and many of you uh, have heard through, um, you know, especially supervisor friend um, about issues, um, particularly related to enforcement. Um, you know, as Mr. Drake said, we have never revoked a permit um, from any vacation rental holder, at least uh, to her knowledge. Um, and, you know, ultimately we are going to have to make sure that um, we strike a balance, I mean, and, and uh, enforce codes against bad actors um, who, you know, really give a bad name uh, for vacation rentals in general. Um, you know, I heard from actually some vacation rental owners that uh, they also did not feel um, adequately uh, engaged in this process of revising the codes um, that we never, uh, that she never received notice that the county was updating these codes and, and didn't receive a notice from the planning department via, um, you know, her contact information that's on record. So, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity to continue to improve these codes. And I mean, I think that we all recognize policy making is an iterative process. Um, you know, I don't hear, you know, as, well, I should say, as Director um, Malloy explained, uh, if we were to try to revise the ordinance at this point, we're looking at nine to 10 months of delay. Uh, and I don't hear um, support from any fellow board members in doing that. Um, so uh, I, you know, at this point, I think the best way forward, uh, I, I have to say is to implement the ordinance we have today um, and really test out some of these um, enforcement mechanisms uh, that have been highlighted here. I mean, this is all new, as you said, that uh, with just two uh, significant violations, someone could uh, be required to come before a, a level five public hearing by the zoning administrator. Um, so, you know, I would just simply pledge to constituents um, that you know, I, that my office will be an ally in making sure that significant violations are recorded uh, and that the code that we have today is actually enforced. Um, and furthermore, as we continue to see issues with this ordinance, um, that I will also be happy to take the lead in helping to revise it and engage all elements of the community in doing so. Thank you, Supervisor Cohen. I, I understand your situation coming in at the at the last lap, so to speak, in this process. But let me say that it has been an ongoing one. We had public hearings on it, we had input. And then there's a somewhat of a conflict. I mean, part of the Coastal Act is to assure that the, the general public who do not live on the coast have access to it. And that's part of this whole situation that's um, that's developed from uh, as the result of the 19, was it 1972 Coastal uh, Act that was approved by voters of the California. So it, it, it creates somewhat of a conflict of its own on the planning process of what this county might want and what the Coastal Commission, which is enacted by law and are represented by many elected officials as well. But uh, so it's, uh, it's a dicey situation, but I, I, I really uh, want to say for the uh, 
the board in the past, and I know that Supervisor Koenig uh, realizes this, that uh, we went through a long process to get to where we are and we got some give uh, more than, uh, than we, uh, we, we took or we received more than we, uh, we gave out uh, from the Coastal Commission. So I, um, I think that uh, it's as good as we're gonna get for this time. And I do appreciate that we certainly will uh, take a continued look at this. And uh, I, I, I understand your, your comments, Supervisor Koenig. And uh, I think this is the best we can get at this point and uh, we will keep an eye on it. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Chair, there's a motion in a second. Uh, the motion. Oh, we'll with you yeah. and Coonerty. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's been a sure. long time. Yeah, all right. Okay, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. And Chair McPherson? Aye. Now we, we are going to skip to uh, schedule item for 1045, and it's almost 11 o'clock, but we didn't want to finish that item. Uh, item number 13, uh, the Zone 7 Board of Directors Special Meeting. The Board of Supervisors shall recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, Zone 7, to convene and carry out a special meeting as outlined in the memorandum of Zone 7 Board Chair. And that's that friend. Uh, we have a memo of the Zone 7 Chair, a special meeting for today, January 26th, 2021 and Zone 7 Board of Directors Agenda, January 26, 2021. Uh, supposedly to start at 10.45, but we're gonna be closer to 11. Uh, Supervisor Friend, would you please uh, take over your Zone uh, 7 Board Chair? Yes, thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. We're going to get the Zone 7 meeting underway. We're going to, for January 26, 2021, our 1045 scheduled item, we'll begin with a roll call from the clerk. Thank you. Director Koenig. Present. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Colbertson. Bilicek? Here. Non-voting members, Lucas? I think she's here. I see her online. I'm gonna, <clears throat> there you go. Yeah, I'm here, yeah. Thank you. And non-voting member, Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Madam Clerk. We're gonna move on to the consideration of late additions, corrections, revisions, and deletions. Mr. Strudley, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Brent, uh, Chair Friend. All right, and thank you. We're obviously thinking a lot about you up in the evacuation zone. Thank you for making the time to be with us today. We're gonna to move on to item three, which is oral communications. This is an opportunity for members of the community as well as the board of directors to address this board on any item that's on today's agenda or is within the purview of the zone seven board. Each speaker uh, will have no more than uh, three minutes to address us. I do believe that Dr. Bilicic would like to address us first, then I'd like to open it up for the community uh, for an opportunity to speak during oral communications. Thank you, Chair Friend. Um, first of all, I would like to introduce Violet Lucas as a new non-voting -vo member. She was um, introduced at the last meeting, but wasn't able to be here. So I wanted to make sure that, uh, that everybody's aware she is present. She is a lifetime resident of Watsonville, has, lives in um, District 7, and is very much aware of the flooding areas that we have in the levee. So, and then also I wanted to introduce and welcome um, Council Member Aurelio Gonzalez, also a non-voting member but I'm not sure if he's on or not, but I uh, wanted to welcome him to the group. And then for uh, Bruce McPherson, I just wanted to welcome you as being the chair of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you for all the welcomes and uh, we appreciate your background photo there. Um, is, Madam Clerk, is there anybody from the community that'd like to address us during oral communications? We have one speaker so far. Um, if you give me one second, I will share the screen and turn Thank on the timer. Okay. 
speaker with the tele who is calling in with the telephone number 2915. You will have two minutes to speak. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I know that there is an agenda item number 11 on this morning's Board of Supervisor agenda that was not able to be um, reviewed and publicly discussed before this meeting that directly um, applies to this meeting. So I'm curious if this special meeting will be able to take action um, given that there was no action yet taken on item number 11 to form the joint power authority. I think that's a good move to bring um, all of those um, entities and jurisdictions together and uh, to move forward on improving flood control for the zone seven areas. Again, I do want to suggest that the zone seven and the jur new jurisdiction uh, joint powers being formed consider doing some controlled flooding in the agricultural areas that are fallow to allow for groundwater recharge. As I've mentioned before, Dr. Helen Dalkey at UC Davis has done extensive research on this and it works. The Pajaro Valley area has had problems with seawater intrusion and uh, the Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency is doing a stellar job to address it. But this could be one more tool in the box that could help prevent seawater intrusion or push it back. I hope you will consider this and have a public workshop with Dr. Dalkey as a guest. Thank you very much. And Director Friend, that appears to be the last public comment we have. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll move on to item four, which is the approval of the Zone 7 board meeting uh, minutes. Or is there any director that has any comment on the minutes before we open it up for the community? Um, seeing none, um, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Chair, I see no public comment on this item. All right, we'll bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion? I'll move for approval. Um, okay, we've got a motion from Director Caput and a second from Director Bilicic. Um, uh, Director Koenig, I assume you may want to ab abstain I'll on this abstain. item? Uh, I'll abstain, yes, thank okay. you. Okay, then we'll do a roll call vote, please. Director Koenig? Abstain. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Colbertson? Bilicek? Yes. Thank you. And we'll just pretend that I voted aye on that item too. <gasps> I apologize, <laughs> Chair right. Fred. It was, a, it was a phantom call, <laughs> Chair's vote. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. All right, so we're going to move on to, to the action of the consent agenda. While this is listed as item five, it actually addresses items nine and ten on the uh, consent agenda. Are, would any board member like to speak to any of the items on consent? Um, Director Cavett, you still have your, your hand raised. Are you interested in speaking on a consent item, or is that so? No, I, I'm okay. sorry. I should have I should have put the hand down. No, that's okay. That's all right. Um, is there anybody from the community who'd like to address us on the consent items? Chair, I see nobody from the community with their hand raised. Okay, I would entertain a motion from the board. I would like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a right. second? Okay, we've got a motion from Director Bill, such as second uh, from Director McPherson. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Colbertson? Bilicek? Yes. And Chair Friend. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I get really sensitive when I don't get 
<laughs> All right, so move on to the, the regular agenda. Item six is as the board of directors of the flood control and water conservation district zone seven, we're going to consider nominations for election of the zone seven board of directors chair and vice chair as outlined in the memo of the district engineer, Mr. Stradley. Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the board. Um, in conformance with the rules and regulations of Zone 7, the board uh, typically elects and nominates uh, the chair and vice chairperson for the uh, upcoming calendar year at our January board meeting, which is what this item deals with. Um, the election is held by a majority vote. We have had tremendous success uh, in the administration of Zone 7 in addition to uh, advocacy items with um, the existing chair and vice chair and uh, staff recommendation is to um, continue to seat our, our existing chair as the ongoing chair uh, of, the, of the district and to continue have our vice chair as uh, Director Bilicic um, so that we have some great representation from the city of Watsonville and I also just wanted to add uh, as a strongly related but separate item that I didn't have a chance to get my hand up on during oral communications. Um, we, we did receive confirmation from the city of Watsonville of uh, Dr. Bilicic's continued appointment from the city of Watsonville as uh, our voting member and wanted to welcome Ari Parker as a, a confirmed alternate voting member for the city of Watsonville moving forward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Strudley. Are, are there any comments from board members before we open it up for the community? Uh, seeing none, is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Yes, Chair, there's, we have one caller. Thank you. Give me one second. There we go. Okay, caller whose telephone number ends in 2915. You will have two minutes to speak. When I unmute you, please accept it and begin speaking. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I am very glad to hear that Ari Parker will be involved in this Zone 7. She is a strong advocate, as is... Um, Director Bilicic for the Watsonville area, those um, communities especially that are very prone to the hazards of flooding along the Pajaro River. So um, I'm very glad to hear that Ari Parker is now um, an, an alternate and look forward to future meetings with all of the board intact and uh, looking out for the best interests of those affected by potential flooding. Thank you. Thank you. Our next caller is Monica McGuire. You have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Hi there. Um, Monica McGuire, yes, asking that you, again, for ease as well as uh, respect, acknowledge that you know that the caller from telephone number 2915 is uh, Becky Steinbrenner and the chances of it being anybody else are very slim and that you honor her because she is calling and you can and she always adds so much. Um, also the uh, the timing and, and such before of asking for a public comment didn't allow me to get the hand raised so um, th there's just technical issues with a number of people still and um, please keep allowing for that. Uh, it does seem as though the questions that Ms. Steinbrenner raised in the first uh, comment she made are things that could be answered. And I'm just again asking that you answer our comments and jokingly as uh, Mr. Friend talked about, he doesn't like to be ignored. It's obvious that no one does. So please do respond fully. Thank you so much. And Chair, that appears to be our last public comment. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I apologize, Ms. McGuire, that we missed you on the uh, oral communications. Thanks for that information. Um, is there a motion to actually nominate? Um, while there's a recommendation from staff, I think formally uh, the names have to be actually nominated for chair and vice chair. So if there's somebody, if there's nomination, now would be the opportunity to do it from the board. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make the nomination for uh, 
Mr. Friend, do you continue with Mr. Bilsich as vice chair? Second. Are there any other nominations? Okay, uh, we'll close the nominations and we'll move to a vote uh, from the motion was from Director McPherson and the second is from Director Coonerty. Roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Colbertson? Aye. Milicic? Aye. Chair Friend? Aye. That item passes unanimously. We'll move on to item seven, which is as the board of directors of zone seven to consider approval of a joint exercise power of, uh, powers agreement by and among the city of Watsonville, the county of Monterey, the county of Santa Cruz, the Monterey County Water Resources Agency, the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District or zone seven to form the Papero Regional Flood Management Agency to consider the indemnif indemnity agreement regarding the Papero River Flood Risk Management Project and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have the indemnity agreement, the JPA agreement for this new body and a slide set. Uh, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the board. For this item, I'd like to uh, defer to our district engineer, Matt Machado, who will present uh, item seven and the presentation associated for it. Matt, Mr. Oh, are you on? I was I was in transition, getting upgraded. So I appreciate that. I am I'm live now. So uh, thank you, Chair Friend and Directors of Zone Seven. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here in a moment to uh, to present a PowerPoint. One second, please. Did I pick the right one? Can everybody see my, my screen? Okay, thank you. All right, I'd like to uh, begin with uh, thanking the Zone 7 Board of Directors for their continued support of this project. I'd also like to uh, extra thanks to Director Caput for his continued community engagement. Uh, also to Director Bilicic for her uh, continued community engagement and to uh, special thanks to Chair Friend very strong and effective advocacy uh, leading to, uh, all of this leading to some critical milestones this year, which I'll share in a moment. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see here, one second. That didn't move, did it? There it goes. Can you see the second slide? All right, sorry, making sure our technology is working here. So share a little bit about a history. So back in uh, 1949, the Army Corps uh, constructed the current system that we have, the levees that we have. But as we all know, uh, even as early as 1955, we had significant flooding. Uh, again, we had flooding in 1958, and then another major flood in 1995. Uh, and then again in 1998 was significant flooding. So we've had a history of flooding, which has led to uh, the need to do project development of a solution for this flooding. Uh, we can see on this slide the, uh, the long history of planning with different alternatives and different processes. I do wanna take your attention to our December 2019 uh, major milestone where when the director's report was uh, approved by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, this gave us federal environmental clearance, allowing us to begin design and secure federal funding major milestone. Uh, that milestone, which you can see December 12, 2019, uh, has led to securing additional funds for design work. We did receive 1.8 million of federal appropriations in fiscal year 20, uh, back in 2020 in February. And uh, most recently we received $2.815 million of federal funds for FY21. Uh, this does round out our federal funds needed to complete the design of phase one. So major milestones uh, and the momentum continues. And so we've also seen some major milestones with our state partners. Uh, our project does have a um, 
subventions agreement with the state of California. The subventions agreement uh, does allow a 70% match to our local share. And I won't get into all the details of how that funding works specifically, but I will share that the state has been a great partner uh, and we see opportunity to even further increase those funding matches uh, beyond the 70%. Our project is, is such that it could qualify for even a greater uh, match, but that would require, as you can see on the slide, a water code fix, which would be special legislation, but uh, we are striving that direction and uh, we feel that there's a great path forward with, uh, with our state partners as well as with our federal partners. So back to, uh, back to our, our project specifics. Um, the item before you today is our Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency, uh, JPA adoption. Uh, the formation of a regional flood risk management uh, JPA has been identified as the most efficient and effective governance approach for reducing flood risk on the lower Pajaro River. Uh, it would be a single, sorry, it would be a single purpose agency um, best positioned to support flood risk reduction, project implementation, and ensure consistent long-term operation, maintenance, repair, replacement, and rehabilitation of the system. And so that is a, um, our decision today. And so uh, our recommendation is going to be to form this new JPA. I would like to share with uh, the board that later this year, we envision pursuing a Prop 218 rate assessment uh, that will go to all the voters of of the affected area. We would also begin design of the levies, uh, signing an agreement with, uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers, and we expect to complete our CEQA, our state environmental document later this year. Today's proposed JPA, the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency would also uh, act as the local sponsor uh, they provide assurances to state and federal agencies for the operations and maintenance. Uh, the JPA would be the finance and, and lead for implementation. And uh, it would consist of the five member agencies, those being the, the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, Monterey County, the city of Watsonville, and your zone seven uh, district, and then also the Monterey County Water Resource Agency. Additionally, the JPA would be a singular agency focused on flood issues and project delivery. Uh, it would have preference with state and federal government to provide funding for to single governing as the local sponsor. Uh, a JPA would be an efficient decision making authority and a single JPA would have the ability to quickly adapt to changing conditions. So a lot of benefits to having a, a JPA represent our project delivery. We do expect, um, well, there are some obligations as a JPA, and I will quickly go through them. Uh, at this time, there are no financial obligations to member agencies. That's initially the, the case. Uh, I would like to share that uh, in the future, we would be bringing back a funding agreement to each of our member boards, uh, including the Zone 7 board. Uh, this uh, funding agreement would be funded within our existing Zone 7 budget. Um, the uh, obligation of the JPA also would be uh, to execute any cost share and other agreements with state and federal agencies. And uh, another uh, obligation would be to um, pursue and adopt the indemnity agreement for Watsonville. Our uh, JPA powers will include the ability to acquire, construct, manage, control, maintain, improve, repair, replace, and operate any infrastructure, uh, issue bonds, participate in financing, enter into contracts, hire staff, and perform all acts necessary to, can, to carry out the purpose of the agreement and the agency. The proposed JPA uh, would be composed as follows. It would be one member of the Board of Supervisors, one member of our Zone 7 Board, uh, one member of the Watsonville City Council, one member of the Monterey County Water Resource Agency, and one member of the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. Some highlights of how the new board will conduct its business. 
Uh, it would require, uh, to meet quorum, would require three-fifths of board members. Um, of course, majority of quorum to carry any action. Uh, each member's vote would be equally weighted. Um, one interesting component is that the annual budget would require unanimous vote of all members. And, um, and uh, operating expenses will be established through a separate agreement, which we would bring back to, uh, to your board and to the other boards to adopt. Some of the next steps uh, for the JPA is uh, the administrative tasks to set it up uh, and then to fund through an interim basis by uh, member agency staff. Uh, we would develop a charter, other guiding planning documents. Uh, we would look at long-term staffing plans and we would at some point transition the uh, operations and maintenance from the member agencies to the JPA. The recommended actions before you today is to consider the joint exercise of powers agreement by and among the member agencies. And then to consider the indemnity, indemnity agreement regarding the Bahar River flood risk reduction project by and among the member agencies and authorize the chair to sign the indemnity agreement and staff is available to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Director Machado. Just as one or two points of clarification here. Um, the slide deck said that one of the members is from the Watsonville City Council. It's actually selected by the Watsonville City Council. It doesn't have to be a city council member of the city of Watsonville. Uh, so just a, a minor but important change on that uh, or notification on that. And two, there was an issue raised by a member of the public as to whether uh, Zone 7 could act in advance of, of, of the County Board of Supervisors on effectuating this agreement, and, and we can. Uh, we've got that authority and ability to. We're just another member agency or party to this greater JPA. Are there any members of the board that have any questions on this right now? Um, Please, Director Koenig. Yeah, so I mean, my understanding is today we're not actually agreeing to any specific project. We're simply creating the JPA. Um, as stated. So, I mean, the, the details of any project or something that would come before that JPA in the future. So that technically is correct. Um, the project is, uh, is fairly well described through the Army Corps process and through our environmental documents. Uh, but technically today, our recommended action is to form the JPA. And that is a specific action of its own. Great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have a quick question, uh, Chairman Friend. Yeah, uh, I noticed, uh, is, there a, is there a set number of members on the JPA? Uh, can we add one? Can we, you know, add two or? Chair, if I can, if I may answer that. Oh, sorry, please, please do directly, yes. Thank you. And so uh, the structure of the JPA is set by the JPA agreement itself. And so adoption today would, would set that uh, the member agency representation at the five members, as I described in the PowerPoint. So Director Caput, um, the adoption today would set that structure up today. Okay, so I don't know if we, uh, Director Friend has said either, either or, uh, one from Santa Cruz County, that would be uh, District 2, you, or, or District 4, that myself. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, it also has, under the Zone 7 appointee, a position coming from either District 2 or 4. So in theory, uh, we could both, if the respected bodies supported that, serve on this JPA, just representing either Zone 7 or the Board of Supervisors. Okay, so that would we're talking about either yourself or myself, not both of us. Is that correct? No, what I'm saying is that in, we could both serve. We would uh, one would represent the board of supervisors as a board of supervisor appointee, and one would represent the zone seven appointee. Okay, uh, that, uh, we're talking about two out of the five then. Correct. Or one. Okay. Right. Correct. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, man. Director Caput, if I may, uh, the conversation, the way the document and the agreement has been written would be to have representation from your district, so you, and also representation from District 2, uh, Supervisor Friend or Director Friend. Uh, so our 
the way the document is written is to have both of your representation on the board from the start. Okay, uh, that's great. And, uh, you know, this uh, project is so important that I would not I would really not care if I was not included as long as we moved forward and got this thing approved. Uh, we've been looking at this, well, my entire career on the board uh, for 10 years, and uh, it's been discussed for 30 years before I even got on the board. So I, I'm just happy that we're going to do this, and I just wanted to clarify you know, uh, the representation on the uh, joint powers. But thanks, thanks a lot, Matt. Any other members? Uh, Director McPherson. Yeah, I can make these comments uh, as well on, on item number 11 on our County Board of Supervisors agenda, but I just have to, this has been a long time in coming. It is uh, well over the top. And I want to thank our county team, especially Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Caput. Our county administrative officer, Carlos Palacios, who's the former city manager of Watsonville, oh. and our uh, Department of Public Works Director Machado, as well as Mark Strudley, for this work over the years, especially to you, uh, Mr. Chair, Supervisor Friend, you've traveled many times to Washington, D.C. to work on this in a collaborative effort to get our federal partners. Uh, this is a long time in coming. There's going to be one big issue in the, the, in the future about uh, approval uh, from voters uh, to support this. Uh, it's going to be a real test, but it needs to be done. And uh, I just hope this is an example of some things that are so needed since 1949 take a long time in coming, but it's about time. And I hope it, uh, it, it just results in a real project in the not too distant future. So thank you everybody for your tremendous efforts that you've Finally got this to this point, uh, and it's the best way to do this in a cooperative effort uh, for that whole area in the uh, Pajaro River. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for the people of the South County. Uh, you need this protection and you need it dearly. And uh, I hope we all see this come to fruition and a great project in the near future. Yeah, uh, I'll jump in there real quick, uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, and uh, about four years, a little over four years ago, uh, uh, five years ago, actually, uh, we did the bench excavation project, which uh, uh, removed uh, 350,000 cubic yards of sediment that was building up over the years. And uh, if we had not done that, uh, that was that was millions of dollars. Uh, I believe it was over 12 million. And if we had not done that, uh, uh, when we did have the major rain that came in about four years ago, uh, it could have been a uh, could have been a big flood again. We uh, the the flood uh, the Pajaro River went actually to the crest, but it never went over the crest of the levees, and. Uh, we also had, because of the Board of Supervisors, um, there were holes in uh, the, le <clears throat> the levee along uh, Coward Road and uh, uh, Riverside Road. And uh, within uh, 12 hours, our board approved a $2.5 million project with the money we really didn't have at the time for uh, granite rock to go out there and dump uh, tons of rock to uh, bolster the levee. If it, if it had broke, the water, I understand, would have gone straight for uh, senior village area. And uh, anyway, I'm very proud of the way the board uh, reacted to that. And I'm very proud of uh, the city of Watsonville and the board doing the bench excavation project which uh, reduced the risk of flooding on the Pajaro. Thank you for that. Um, and thank you for the, the kind words, uh, Director McPherson, and also when you were state senator for supporting some of the funding on the Prop 1A funds that we're now using for this. There has been more movement on this project in the last 12 months than there were in the previous 60. And this creation of this JPA is, while it seems like just a legal formality, is actually a significant movement and uh, an absolutely essential component toward the construction process as required by the state and federal government, our partners on this. 
Um, I know Director or uh, Mr. Strudley will speak a little bit to it, but we have some more good news that just came through on the federal side, uh, was even uh, announced today by Congressman Panetta. So there's, there's just, this is, there's a lot of momentum here and uh, this is an essential next step. I appreciate your comments on that. Uh, Director Bilicic, I believe you had a comment. Yes, I, um, I just wanna thank um, everybody that's been involved, but especially uh, Mark and Matt. Um, you know, getting that federal money and you, Zach, um, and Jimmy Panetta, that has been, I can't tell you, I, when I was first on the council, I remember having these conversations with San Far and now to see it happen is just great to have federal dollars here. And then to have the Department of uh, Water Resources, our state money, that's, I mean, it's incredible the progress this group has made. But in addition to that, city residents really appreciate um, your strong advocacy, advocacy for um, the reduction in trying to get the money um, to be re reduced for what they're actually going to have to pay the, um, the rate. And I know that they keep working on that, working on that. And I think, you know, uh, we couldn't have better leadership working on that project. Thank you. We are very intimately involved with the state on that right now, just so you know, repeated no. calls with our elected delegation and the State Department of Water Resources. We got a great team, especially now with uh, Senator Laird, who is the former director of DWR in that spot. Um, there isn't a whole lot of update there under, other than I can say that, that all three, uh, Assemblymember Rebus and Stone and Senator Laird are completely in our, on our side on what we're looking to do in order to make sure we can reduce the responsibility of the, of the residents down there financially. But thank you for that, Director Bill. It, is, are there any other uh, comments from directors before we open it up to the community for this item? Um, I, I don't see any. I will open it up to the, the community. Anybody like to address us on this item? Yes, we have a couple of people with their hands up. Our first speaker is Bob. You will have two minutes to speak. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and start speaking. The timer will begin when you start. Caller Bob, I know you had your hand up for some time. You might have left us. Oh, there you are. No, I didn't. I'm here. Uh, this is Bob Colbertson. I'm a director. I'm a so I'm uh, muted on the regular director comments. My, my question is, what will the JPA have in relationship to San Benito County and Santa Clara County where 80% of the watershed is? And director, I'm going to switch you over to a panelist. Thank you, Bob. We will get that question addressed in just a second uh, when we bring it back to the board. Uh, are there any other, you, you had mentioned, I believe, Madam Clerk, that there are additional public we, comments? We have one more public comment. Caller whose phone number ends in 29 one five you will have two minutes to speak i'm unmuting you please accept the unmute start speaking the timer will start then thank you this is becky steinbrunner can you hear me yes thank you um i also have the question that uh, mr colbertson brought up what about the other um entities that are um part of the watershed that drains into and affects the Pajaro Valley uh, River. And I, I would like, I, I will be interested to hear the, the board's response to his question. I really want to thank again publicly uh, the efforts of Mr. Strudley. I remember hearing Welcome that it was because of his good work that um, I'm, I'm hearing something else here. Can you still hear me? Yes. No. All right. Thank you. There's interference um, on your end, I think. Um, I remember hearing from, I think it was Congressman Panetta and also the, um, the federal government agency, the Army Corps of Engineers, that the reason they felt comfortable moving forward on this 
was because of the excellent work that Mr. Strudley had done and presented. So he's my hero. <laughs> and I really um, am glad that he's on board with all of this. And I want to thank Supervisor Caput for ensuring that there is representation on this jurisdiction from both districts two and four. That's critical because both districts are heavily invested and involved by this project and both county district supervisors need to be on this. I'm a little concerned that the Watsonville City representative does not have to be a city council member, an elected official, but I have full confidence in the current selection of uh, Director Bilicic having served on the city council and very active. Okay. And that appears to be the end of public comment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. And there was a question from Mr. Culbertson, uh, Director Culbertson, to uh, Mr. Strudley. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, Director Culbertson, in response to your question about the uh, representation in the upper watershed, um, that is accomplished through Zone 7's participation as well as the county's participation as member agencies to the Pajaro River Watershed uh, Flood Prevention Authority. It was a JPA that was established many years ago. Um, because of this exact issue and the recognition of uh, waters coming from elsewhere, higher up in the watershed, um, the, the JPA's jurisdiction is restricted in this case because we really want to focus our efforts and our leadership on the local projects here. Um, but the issues upstream uh, are being well represented and dealt with through both the board of the, the other JPA, the Flood Prevention Authority, as well as staff's membership in the staff working group. Um, so we can continue to respond to your questions related to upper watershed issues uh, at the staff level and relay those um, to the staff working group uh, of the Flood Prevention Authority as they come up. Thank you. Is there, uh, I think it's now time to consider a motion. Is there a motion for uh, the recommended actions? Yeah. Can't hear you. Director Caput, um, we're looking for a motion now. For I'll make a motion. Uh, Nancy, were you going to, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, there you go. Yes, I, I was going to make the motion, but either one, it doesn't matter. I think I it's somebody either, either. I'll go second, let her have the first. All right, so Director. Uh, a, quick, a quick comment. I just want to thank uh, Bruce LeClaire for all the work he did uh, before Mark Strudley uh, came on board. Mark, you've done a great job, and uh, we're very proud of you. But uh, Bruce uh, LeClaire did a great job also getting us to where we are. Okay, thank you. Okay, so a couple things. A direct, if you're, if you could mute, if you're not actually speaking right now, that's why we're getting the feedback. Thank you. I still didn't actually hear a motion for the recommended actions, although I heard a lot of conversation about who wanted to make it. So, uh, Director Bilicic, if I think you wanted to do it, but if you could formally actually make that motion, that'd be great. Okay, I will make the motion that we um, approve this new JPA and um, move forward. Okay, so for all I'll second. Okay, I'll assume that's for all the recommended actions, correct, Director Bilicic? Yes, all the recommended actions. Perfect. Right, we, have, we have a motion from Director Bilicic and a second from uh, Director Caput. A roll call, please. Director Koenig? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Colbertson? Aye. Bilicic? Aye. Chair Friend? Aye. Great, we'll move on to item eight, which is as the board of directors, this is the program manager's report, as the board of directors of zone seven to consider the status report on the Pajaro River flood risk management project as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. Mr. Stradley, please. Thank you, Chair Friend, the members of the board. Um, as, as Chair Friend mentioned earlier, this, this is a tremendously exciting time for this project. Uh, we've reached tremendous milestones over the past year including the item that you just approved. Um, so we thank you for your support for that item. Um, 
On the federal side, uh, we have been making tremendous strides. As Chair Friend mentioned and, and District Engineer Machado mentioned, we received our uh, director's report last year um, along with an initial appropriation of $1.8 million through the uh, fiscal year 20 work plan that was an initial uh, funding push to start the design work of the first prioritized reach of the project. Um, and just uh, after actually we developed a slide presentation, which is why the slide presentation uh, misrepresents it slightly at 2.915, we just received word um, that we were awarded an additional $2.815 million in design phase funding from the Army Corps in the FY21 work plan. So a huge thanks goes out to um, the, the ton of work that Congressman Jimmy Panetta has been doing for us. He and his staff have been absolutely fantastic and, and fully behind this project. Um, Chair Friend and uh, uh, Director Caput in their advocacy for this project, including their leadership, on our trips to DC, um, as well as all the other tremendous support we get from uh, Director Bilosich, the city of Watsonville, our partners in Monterey County, has just been a huge group effort to get to this point. But this is, this is the funding we need from the Army Corps to start design for the first phase of this project. We are entering the design phase. This project is gonna start getting designed. That's, that's huge. Um, any, any day now we're going to, I wanted to have an executed design agreement to show you all today. Um, that has not been possible, but literally any day now we will be getting an executed, a fully executed design agreement from the Army Corps. This um, builds upon your uh, board's approval from uh, last June for the chair to sign an executed design agreement, um, which we will have him sign as soon as a final version is ready from the Army Corps, which again, we expect it to happen any day. Uh, the Army Corps has accepted our closeout requests of our uh, prior agreements. Um, and with that request comes a credit of just above $3.3 million, which uh, of extra costs of staff time that we have um, provided birth from our county and Monterey County um, towards the project. And those costs will be credited when we sign a construction agreement, a, part, a PPA, a project partnership agreement, uh, when this first design phase is finished. So we won't see that credited money yet, but we will see it credited um, to the project when we enter the construction phase. Um, we have been getting tremendous support from the Army Corps. Um, uh, probably not many of you, or maybe none of you, uh, had the chance to look at the work plan issuance, but we were, we were top dogs in terms of um, the most funding out of the work plan for uh, the allocations. So this is a big deal. Uh, that's a great allocation from the work plan. Um, we continue to work with our partners at the state. Um, as soon as we have the project management plan and the design agreement ready from the Army Corps, that will be funneled into our subventions agreement with the state of California. Again, we have the capability through AB 489 to leverage our subventions allocation ahead of or in the absence of the Army Corps. But uh, if we were to exercise that, it would present some risk to us um, for continued investment from the federal side. So we're not going to exercise that yet because everything has been moving so smoothly and successfully with the Army Corps. Uh, we don't want to jeopardize the, the federal investment to this project, which is to the tune of about 200 and $50 million. Um, so we're going to continue on our path uh, that we were typically going to follow with federal execution of the project and the subventions uh, supporting 70% of the locally required dollars to support the project. Um, as Chair Friend mentioned, we are having additional conversations with the state about that 70% allocation. Uh, and we have tremendous su support again from Revis, uh, Stone, and Laird. Um, in our advocacy for the project. So we will continue to provide updates to this board um, as we continue to make strides along that front. But we are very hopeful that we'll have some sort of improvement and resolution to the cost share coming from the state. Um, <clears throat> on, on the local match, we, we have spoken to you before about our aspirations and need to uh, develop a benefit assessment district to support that local match to the project. Uh, 
Uh, obviously, we continue to strive towards reducing that local match requirement through these conversations with the state, and we're hopeful of that. We continue to apply for grants to uh, cover our costs uh, in accessory of our subventions authorization or, or as part of it. Um, but, you know, everything is aligned for this project except for the things that we can't control, like COVID and the pandemic and the economic effects that it's had um, throughout the country, including locally here. And that is what limits our capability right now to um, envision going out for a benefit assessment district creation uh, this spring. In all likelihood, that will probably occur uh, sometime in the fall uh, when the economy rebounds and it is appropriate and um, and meaningful for us to, to uh, engage with the public on that issue and to strive to raise funds. And if we are so lucky as to not require funds from the public, uh, should our conversations with the state be successful, then we will have that news to share with everyone. Um, you, know, you all are uh, now fully up to speed on the governance issues associated with this project with the, uh, the tentative adoption of the JPA to support this project and other flood risk reduction solutions in the Pajaro area. Um, and we continue to work on our CEQA efforts, our environmental review efforts, um, and we expect to have a draft document ready for public review sometime later this summer. Uh, and with that, uh, I am happy to answer any questions uh, from the board. Uh, thank you, Mr. Strudley. Um, you're the right person at the right time for this project, and we do appreciate everything you're doing. And especially, as I mentioned earlier, with all the other things you have to do for the county with debris flow and other flood modeling and your own personal situation, evacuating from the fires and such, uh, but not letting this project slip has been a lot of, a huge testament to your character and your abilities. And I wanna publicly acknowledge that. Um, thank you for all that. Is there anybody from the board that has any questions on this, uh, this update? Uh, question chair? Please. Um, Thank you, Mr. Stradley, for the for the update. Um, I'm curious just how the the project uh, accounts for sea level rise and uh, increase, uh, uh, you know, atmospheric rivers coming our way. Um, you know, I very much understand the need to to keep Watsonville safe uh, as well as the surrounding farmlands. Um, but this is also exactly the kind of area that um, in environmentalists and climate scientists would tell us is, is ultimately one that we should look at returning to nature. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any you know, ways this project has accounted for things like that. Um, you know, what would happen in the event that um, you know, even with these improvements, it looked like uh, the, the uh, Powell River is gonna expand uh, beyond the capacity of, of the levees, uh, you know, is there opportunity to flood the agricultural side of, of the area as uh, suggested by a um, member of the public, Becky Steinburner? Um, I'm just curious how, you know, how we look forward to go, going, how we're looking at going forward in a, in a changing world here. Sure, th those, are, those are fantastic questions and, and there's a lot there. So let me see if I can unpack it all and respond and, and you can let me know if, if I missed anything. Um, the, the Army Corps did uh, and is required to do a climate uh, change assessment with their project. So there is an appendix to our feasibility study, which outlines their analysis. I'm happy to share that with you offline if you care to look at it, um, but, but the details uh, may bore you. The, the punchline out of that appendix was that there was the existing data um, suggests a, a, a very weak to non-existent uh, relationship um, for climate change. So I'm not, I'm not denying that there's climate change and neither is the Army Corps and we are certainly um, thinking along those lines, but the analysis that they are required to do um, suggests that there are not hugely demonstrable uh, engineering components to this project that need to be put in place above those that are part of the project itself to deal with the climate change, expected climate change and the analysis that came out of that appendix. That being said, the project does propose to provide 100 year level of protection um, to most of the lower Pajaro Valley. And with that protection will be uh, a fair amount of, uh, for lack of a better term, freeboard that can accommodate a lot of the effects of climate change that we will see. 
Um, it's also helpful to note that although we are keen on securing this 100 year level of protection, then that is kind of the minimum de facto standard for flood control projects around the state and around the country. Um, the most critical of, and, and harmful events are the ones that are of um, higher frequency, potentially lower, lower magnitude than a 100 year level event, but higher frequency. The ones that do the most damage and are of the most significant threat to communities around the country are kind of in the vicinity of the 20 year to 50 year recurrence interval flows. Those are the ones that really at a bare minimum need to be tackled by any flood control project. And this one obviously accomplishes that. With sea level rise, um, we are doing a number of things. One is uh, we are actually pursuing a separate project under uh, another special district that's strongly related to this one, the Pajaro Storm Drain Maintenance District. It's actually the precursor maintaining agency of the levee system before Zone 7 was created in 1991. Um, and that project is engaged with the Army Corps Continuing Authorities Program to develop a multi-benefit ecosystem restoration project in the lower Pajaro River, the Watsonville Slough, and the Lagoon. And we are just now beginning to enter into the feasibility phase for that project. It's a much smaller scale project than the one being described here, uh, but we do have full funding for it. So we have 50% cost share coming from the Army Corps and 50% coming from a grant from OPC. So there's no cost to the rate payers of that special district, which are essentially the same rate payers as Zone 7. Um, that project will uh, envision to expand the tidal marsh and wetland complex of the lower slough system to provide um, a capacitor, a shock absorber for tidal incursions that we are tending to see uh, get worse and worse with sea level rise and with um, stronger king tides. Um, so we look forward to sharing with you more detail on that project as it evolves through um, the power storm drain maintenance district. We can share that with you through zone seven. Um, and the other thing I wanted to respond to you and see if I covered all the bases, Director, is your, your comment about um, flooding agricultural land and groundwater recharge. Um, we have certainly been thinking along those lines. Um, uh, you know, it's fantastic that we have members of the community that are thinking that way, but we've been thinking about, uh, along those lines for quite some time now. The levy setbacks that are described by this project envision additional recharge to groundwater through um, a higher frequency of higher flow events that would engage with a floodplain that is wider behind setback levees. Levees that are essentially set back further away from their existing configuration. Um, flooding a, a adjacent agricultural land is um, kind of a non-starter for two reasons. One of which is it's just not feasible to do in terms of the type of agriculture we have here versus the type of ag that is present in, centri in the Central Valley, which much more, um, is much more capable at allowing for recharge without damaging crops. So apple orchards, uh, strawberries, truck, uh, truck crops, and other things are not tolerant to um, incursions of flood water uh, as they are to uh, almond orchards and, and rice fields in the Central Valley, which is typically what you see there. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we don't have a huge expanse of floodplain. And so um, it, it's not uh, possible and reasonable for us to uh, ask the agricultural community to take on that much of a burden, even while a flood project is, is being built to protect um, just urban areas. We are trying to accomplish uh, flood protection for multiple areas, including protection of the, the agricultural economy and agricultural well being, as well as the urban well being of the Pajaro Valley. So I'll just end there and, and see if I responded to all of your questions and concerns. Yeah, that's great. I think you touched everything and I, I appreciate your comprehensive answer. Any other questions from directors? This is just an accept and file item, but are there any other questions? Okay, uh, Director Bill said she had a question. Comment, can I make a comment? Yeah, please, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanna say how much um, I have seen Mark and Matt work um, with the Pajaro Valley community and the farming community. And they have been very, very concerned about flooding. If you recall in, I think it was 95, they lost so much um, when the flood went towards Pajaro and the topsoil, everything. So it's really good that Mark 
that continues to work with that group um, because we need their support to make this all work together. Thank you. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on this item? Karen, there, oh, we do have one person who has their hand up. Hold on one second, please. Okay. Caller whose telephone number ends in 2915. You're being unmuted. Please accept the unmute. When you start speaking, the timer will start. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, again, I also want to thank um, Mr. Strudley for his good work, and this is an excellent report. I also want to thank um, Supervisor Koenig for his very thoughtful questions about climate change and sea rise, and appreciated Mr. Strudley's very thorough response. Thank you for that information. It helps members of the public like me who are also interested in this to learn more. Regarding the um, possibility of controlled flooding, I, I understand the difference in agricultural crops in the Pajaro Valley versus the Central Valley, but there are a number of apple orchards in the Pajaro Valley that I think could be considered um, I, I know that Dr. Dalkey, Helen Dalkey, has been studying uh, which crops can handle flooding or at least temporary flooding. And the orchard crops tend to be very resilient um, in terms of that. I know that she has focused on almonds because that is what is in her study area. But I would like to um, research myself the ability of apple orchards to also um, sustain temporary flooding. And to that end, I am aware that the Kelly Thompson Ranch has embarked upon a very meaningful and substantial managed aquifer recharge project where they are collecting stormwater runoff from adjacent farms and doing a, an excellent job um, in collecting stormwater. This could be used for, for flood water as well. Other projects like this working with Resource Conservation District. The farmers recognized the benefit of the groundwater recharge, and the Kelly Thompson Ranch actually took. Chair, it appears that was the end of public comment. Thank you. Um, is there a motion for this acceptance file? Oh, I'll make a motion to accept this file. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right, there's a motion from Director Bilicich and a second from Director Koenig. And, and just I'd just like to close by saying, I mean, th this, these levees protect a lot more than agricultural land. They protect uh, two federally disadvantaged communities in Watsonville and Pajaro that rely on the lowest level of flood protection of any federally funded project in the state and one of the lowest in the United States. If you ever wanted um, to witness something that could be uh, really envision for uh, inequity and questions about where funding goes across this world and priorities that clearly advantage uh, upscale communities. This is a perfect example. And we should recognize that this project um, preserves the life and safety of the most disadvantaged within our respective two county communities, not just to mention their lifelines through the, econ uh, through the economic component of agriculture. So uh, if anything, I think this project that's being proposed um, as Director Strudley uh, Mr. Strelli alluded to isn't even big enough, but um, I think that we should focus on on people's lives first before some of the other considerations. And I think that that's that's what what we're doing with this. So we do have a motion and a second, and we'll do a roll call on this. Director Koenig, aye. Coonerty, aye. Caput, uh, aye. <laughs> McPherson, aye. Colbertson. You are on mute, Director Colbertson. Aye. 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 And Aye. Director Bilicic, um, yeah, Bilicic. Aye. Chair Friend. Aye, and thank you all. That will end the Zone 7 meeting. Uh, we'll have to reconvene the Board of Supervisors meeting, so I'll turn it back to Chair McPherson.
Okay, thank you. Uh, and great news, uh, great advancement. Uh, what a terrific project we have going now on track. Uh, the hour is noon, but I would prefer to continue with our, the remaining items on our agenda. I think we can get them in relatively short order before we go into closed session. So I'm going to go back to item number nine, a public hearing to consider accepting the California Coastal Commission uh, refer, referred to as the CCC, modifications to the ordinance number 5346, county code section 1310.611 through 1310.616 regarding accessory structure, home occupations, temporary uses and structures, and, and hosted rentals, adopt resolution accepting the commission's mo uh, actions, or modifications adopt ordinance based on the modifications and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the, of the planning director. We have a resolution temporary uses of uh, CCC amendments ordinance SCCC sections 13, 10, 11, uh, 611 to 616 CCC amendments. Amendments to 13, 10, 611, 616 CCC modification with strike out and underline and a CCC staff report. Uh, we will now hear a presentation from our staff on this. Uh, Chair McPherson, if you would give me one second. Um, Director Malloy, I'm not seeing Stephanie online. Oh, um, she was going to make the presentation. I think she's there now. Oh, there she is. We, she's here now, thank you. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair McPherson, Supervisors, Stephanie Hansen, Principal Planner with the Planning Department. Uh, today's hearing is to request that the board accept the Coastal Commission's modifications to the recently passed ordinance on accessory structures, home occupations, uh, permitting temporary uses and structures, and hosted rentals. The board passed ordinance 5346 on September 15th of 2020, clarifying existing code provisions and establishing new permit procedures aimed at supporting recovery from the economic effects of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, procedures which then became even more critical as we tried to recover from the CZU fires this summer. Uh, county Code Chapter 1310 implements the county's coastal program and therefore amendments must be approved by the Coastal Commission. At the commission's hearing on January 13th of this year, the commission agreed that the amendments are in conformance with the county's local coastal program and that they implement the uh, California Coastal Act. The commission approved the amendments with two small modifications, which were to refer to uh, the potential for a coastal development permit uh, requirements for cargo containers and also for temporary structures and uses. Uh, the text for these amendments appears on page uh, 102 of your packet. Uh, staff is recommending that the board conduct a public hearing to accept these modifications with passage of the resolution uh, transmitting the acceptance to, back to the Coastal Commission and a new ordinance that incorporates the changes. As required by law, the amendments would then return to the Coastal Commission for approval before going into effect. Um, staff is available to answer any questions and I believe Director Malloy is on as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any comments from the board members? Okay, seeing none, do we have any comments from the public? Do we have no, do we have any comments from the public? Chair, I see one hand up. Okay, caller, whose number ends in 2915, please begin speaking. The timer will start when you do. Thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I do have a question about the, um, the change in uh, 
County Code 13.10.612B about cargo containers. The language there says that they are allowed um, outside of the urban and rural services lines in all districts, all zone districts. I have never heard of a rural service line. I've heard of the urban service line, but I would appreciate hearing from Ms. Hansen what is the definition of the rural service line. And um, to be clear, this would also, um, in general, allow businesses to occur, home occupation businesses to uh, become permitted in the residential areas and allow, as I remember, up to five permanent full-time employees. So I'm really hoping that um, the board will pay attention to the impacts on the residential areas. But I am supportive of allowing cottage industries. Um, again, sort of hearkening back to the vacation rental, there needs to be a way for the public to be able to weigh in when these businesses in their neighborhoods are causing parking, noise, whatever problems. And um, I look forward to supporting small business in our county, but would like some clarification on the rural service line that is stated in that code. Thank you very much. And Chair, that is the end of public comment. Okay, we will close the public hearing. Um, the staff, do you have any brief um, answers to the question that was asked? Uh, yes, the, uh, the general plan establishes both an urban services boundary and a rural services boundary. Uh, it's been in place for many, many, many years. Um, the rural service um, boundaries tend to encompass our um, smaller rural villages and towns, such as Boulder Creek, uh, Felton, that, that, those kind of places. And there's, um, I don't know how many, but there's several of them throughout the county. Okay. Um, any questions from the board? Uh, we've, closed, we've closed the public hearing. Do I have a motion to accept recommended actions? So moved. Moved by Supervisor Coonerty. Second. Second by Coonerty. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Captain. Aye. Supervisor Caput, we lost you. Can you please give your vote for this item? Yeah, aye. Thank you. Aye. And and Chair McPherson. Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll go to item number 10. Is a public hearing on the proposed easement by condemnation across real property located in the parking lot adjacent to 2606 and 2610 Chanticleer Avenue, Assessor Parcel Number 025-171-23, and consider resolution of necessity authorizing County Council to institute eminent domain proceedings to obtain possession of the required real property interests as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CAO Director of Public Works. We have a resolution of necessity, Murchison Taylor, I think that's the way it's pronounced, uh, Exhibit A, Exhibit B, and due, di due diligence declaration. Uh, I guess we would have comments from the County Council on this, or is it Kimberly Finley that's going to present this. Yes, hi, how are you? Well, thank you, Kim uh, Finley. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. My name is Kimberly Finley. I'm the Chief Real Property Agent with the Department of Public Works. I appear before you today to request that the board conduct a public hearing regarding the proposed easement by condemnation across the real property adjacent to 2606 and 2610 Chanticleer Avenue, APN 025-171-23, and to request that the board adopt a resolution of necessity authorizing County Council to institute imminent domain proceedings to obtain the necessary real property interests. 
Public Works is requesting a resolution of necessity to proceed with the eminent domain process to obtain 373 square feet of permanent easement and 940 square feet of temporary construction easement over a portion of the parking lot located at APN 0251723. This parking lot is owned by Donald L. Merchinson and Dolores Merchinson as joint tenants, husband and wife, and Carl M. Taylor and Evelyn R. Taylor, husband and wife as joint tenants, but doing business as Merchinson Taylor's Owners Association. Substantial time and county resources have been expended in attempts to offer just compensation to the current property owners of record. However, due to historical complications with the title of this property and the fact that two of the four current owners of record have since deceased, we have been unable to complete payment of just compensation. The county must now move forward with acquiring the proposed easement rights as they are necessary to obtain $93 million in currently approved funds for the Highway 1 41st SoCal Auxiliary Lanes and Pedestrian Bicycle Overcrossing Project. The Highway 1 project proposes to construct northbound and southbound auxiliary lanes between 41st Avenue and SoCal Avenue and construct a new bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing at the Chanticleer Avenue. Historically, this section of Highway 1 has been the busiest in the county, serving over 100,000 vehicles a day, and the auxiliary lanes will benefit the public by improving traffic operations and reducing cut-through traffic. Additionally, the pedestrian bicycle overcrossing at Chanticleer Avenue offers additional public benefit by providing alternative routes for bicyclists and pedestrians. Based on the aforementioned, the Department of Public Works now recommends that the board take the following actions. Number one, conduct a public hearing on the proposed easement by condemnation across real property located at the parking lot adjacent to 2606 and 2610 Chanticleer Avenue APN 0251723 and adopt a resolution necessity authorizing county council to institute imminent domain proceedings to obtain possession of the required real property interests. I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? Okay. Chair, I see no public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll return it then we'll close the public hearing and return it to the board for any comments and uh, a motion. Uh, I'll move the recommended actions. Thank you, Ms. Finley, for the presentation. Second. Moved by friend, seconded by Coney. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. And Chair McPherson. Aye. We will now move to item number 11, consider the joint exercise of power, powers agreement by and among the city of Watsonville, the county of Monterey, the county of Santa Cruz, the Monterey <laughs> County Water Resources Agency and the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, zone number seven, to form the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency authorize the chair to sign the joint exercise powers agreement. Consider, consider the indemnity agreement regarding the Pajaro River Flood Risk Management Project and authorize the chair to sign the indemnity agreement as outlined in the memorandum of Deputy CEO, Director of Public Works. We have three uh, their items, the indemnity agreement, the joint powers agreement agreement and the PRF MA, uh, as well as the JPA si slide set uh, for the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we have discussed this thoroughly in our, uh, our uh, scheduled public hearing with Zone 7 earlier today. Uh, we will, uh, is there a, a presentation? Mr. Machado, would you be making the presentation? Yes, thank you, Chair and Board of Supervisors. Um, I do have the same presentation to share with you. And I think for the record, I will still go through it. Uh, I'll try to move quickly because I know um, I know you have a full agenda still today, uh, if that's okay with you. 
Sure, please do. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So I'll start by thanking the Board of Supervisors for all of their uh, support of this effort. This is a, a major effort for the entire county. I'd like to uh, specifically thank uh, Supervisor Caput and Supervisor Friend for all of your community engagement, uh, Supervisor Friend for all of your effective advocacy and, and all the efforts that you've all done. It's, it's uh, created some great progress and major milestones that I'll share with you briefly. Uh, as we know, the project that we have today was built in 1949. Uh, with that said, we've still experienced considerable flooding, a couple of large events in the 50s, a couple of large events in the 90s, uh, which has led to the need for a new project. Uh, the project alternatives have been developed over, the, over many years, actually decades, uh, and most recently we've secured some major milestones with the December 2019 director's report and final, final feasibility study uh, that report was our federal environmental clearance, uh, and it has enabled us to now secure federal funds to begin design. Uh, that design work uh, is envisioned to kick off this year with uh, the securitization of funding from the federal government in FY20 of 1.8 million. And as Mr. Stredley uh, announced earlier today, that uh, we also received 2.815 million dollars of federal funding and FY21 so that our federal match is fully funded to begin and complete the design of phase one. So a great milestone. Um, additionally, uh, we're working closely with our state partners. We do have a subventions agreement that allows up to a 70% uh, state fund match to our local match of the larger project. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is a major effort in itself uh, in that we are continuing to work with our state partners to further increase that match uh, beyond uh, due to the nature of our project and the competitiveness of our project. So we're working hard to continue to implement our, our state funding um, agreement. Today's decision for the JPA is a critical milestone. Uh, I will share that the formation of this uh, Regional Flood Management Joint Powers Authority has been identified Oh, goodness gracious. Sorry. That was interesting. Sorry about that. Um, has been identified as the most efficient and effective governance approach for reducing flood risk on the lower Pahara River. It's a single purpose agency that's best positioned to support flood risk reduction project implementation and ensure consistent long term operations and maintenance. Uh, later this year, we do envision kicking off a Prop 218 rate assessment uh, that would go to the voters for their consideration so that we could complete our local match uh, funding obligation. Uh, we also envision beginning design and levies. As I mentioned, we do have uh, federal funding in place. And later this year, we envision uh, completing the state environmental clearance CEQA. The, uh, the JPA uh, will be the local sponsor. It will provide assurances to state and federal partners for our operation and maintenance. It will be our finance uh, mechanism. It will lead the implementation of, of financing the project and it will consist of five member agencies, as you can see there. Uh, the JPA is a singular agency focused on flood issues. Uh, it is the preference of state and federal partners to deal with just one entity and we believe that the JPA would provide efficient decision-making authority and uh, being a single agency can adapt quickly to changing conditions. Uh, the current obligations related to the JPA, there are no financial obligations uh, at this point. Uh, I will share that any financial obligations will come back as a separate agreement and would be within our current budget authority in uh, zone seven. And um, so we don't envision that being a hurdle in the future. Uh, we also, uh, another obligation uh, of the JP would be to uh, execute any agreements with state federal partners and, uh, and then also to um, adopt the indemnity agreement for the city of Watsonville. The powers of the JPA will include to acquire, construct, manage, maintain uh, the infrastructure project. Uh, the powers will also include issuance of bonds and participating in, in financing. 
uh, entering into contracts and agreements, uh, hiring staff and contractors, and performing all the purposes or all the uh, necessary acts to carry out the purposes of the agreement and agency. The composition of this JPA is proposed as a five member board consisting of one board of supervisor, one zone seven director, uh, a member from as appointed by the Watsonville City Council, a member of the Monterey County Water Resource Agency, and a member from the Monterey County Board of Supervisors. The uh, JPA will conduct its business based upon a typical quorum, three fifths of board members. Uh, the quorum is sufficient to carry action. Each board member's vote will be equally weighted. Uh, we had uh, written the agreement to have an annual budget that requires unanimous votes. Next steps for the GAPA will be to set up uh, the structure, uh, develop bylaws, et cetera. Um, look at, uh, we're looking at interim staffing with existing member staff, such as our zone seven uh, staffing um, team. And we plan to develop a charter, other guiding uh, documents. And uh, at some point we would transition all of the operations and maintenance of the project from member agencies to the JPA. The recommended actions before you today are to consider the joint exercise of powers agreement uh, by and among our member agencies to form the Pajaro Regional Flood Management Agency and authorize the chair to sign the joint exercise of powers agreement and and preference with uh, state and federal government to provide funding to a single governing local sponsor and to consider the indemnity agreement <clears throat> regarding the Pajaro River flood risk reduction project by and among the member agencies and authorize the chair to sign the indemnity agreement. And with that, I can answer any questions and I believe we have uh, staff available to answer questions as well. Thank you, Mr. Machado. Thank you for your work on this. A uh, great many people have gone into this, as we know, and we've mentioned earlier in our discussion at our plan, our scheduled uh, public hearing earlier today. Um, are there any co uh, further comments from uh, members of the board? I'll just say deja vu, no? <laughs> Very good. Uh, are there any, any comments from the public? Chair, I, I see no hands up. So we have no comments from the public. Okay, I'll return to the board. Uh, any comments, uh, Mr. Friend? Uh, Mr. I'll, I'll, Mr. I'll move the recommended actions. Thank you, Chair. I'll second. Moved by Friend, seconded by Caput. Please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. And Chair McPherson. Aye. Uh, okay, we will now move to item number 12, the final item on our agenda today uh, before we go into a closed session. Uh, consider directing the planning department to include tiny homes, including movable tiny homes, uh, tiny homes on wheels, and tiny homes on foundation uh, in the ADU. Code amendments as legal accessory dwelling units, as outlined in the memorandum of understanding uh, from Supervisors Koenig and McPherson. Um, who is um, who would be making a pre the presentation? With Chair, I'll make a I'll make a short presentation. Okay, excuse me. I'm sorry. I was meant to do that. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Great. I'm going to share. Uh, let's do my desktop here. Great, is that visible for everyone? Got it. Great. Um, so um, I've, we've recommended um, approving use of tiny homes in our county. Um, this actually follows in line with um, actions taken by a number of other cities and counties throughout the state, um, including the city of Fresno, um, San, uh, San Luis Obispo County, the city of Los Angeles, San Diego, San Jose, Humboldt County, and Santa Clara County. Um, so there's lots of model ordinance out there, um, much of which uh, we've provided to the planning department to work with. And the state has taken the position on movable tiny homes as ADUs um, with the Department of Housing and Community Development specifically saying, uh, this was about the San Diego ordinance when it was proposed 
um, in uh, 2019 that HCD supports the city's efforts to encourage and allow a variety of housing choices, including tiny houses as an ADU, as defined in the proposed ordinance amendment. Uh, what is a tiny house? Uh, tiny houses can be stick built, they can be movable, they can even be stackable. Um, the International uh, Residential Code defines a tiny house as being less than 400 square feet. Um, and movable tiny homes are typically um, you know, between eight and a half, and uh, they, they can be as wide as 13 and a half feet, but typically they're, they're more in the eight and a half range because uh, they have to be able to move down the highway. Um, and they are also usually uh, registered with the California DMV. Um, the same goes with their uh, typical height of 13 and a half feet. Um, it's you know, largely based on uh, requirements for moving down the highway. Movable tiny house is not an RV. There's a number of ways uh, that we can write the ordinance. And again, um, this is included in model language provided by other jurisdictions uh, that define it in such a way that it is specifically not an RV. Tiny houses are built to resemble typical cottages or bungalows. A few more examples here. Um, and uh, except movable tiny homes are built on wheels. Um, so really you're just replacing a foundation with a chassis. Um, and if anything, they can actually be much stronger than uh, a typical home because they're designed to be able to go 70 miles an hour down the freeway, hit a pothole and survive. So um, for example, they don't use drywalls in uh, movable tiny homes, instead uh, use um, plywood for, um, for the walls um, so that it doesn't crack or anything uh, in, in moving. Uh, tiny homes um, are also, uh, you know, compact living, sleeping, cooking, sanitation, and work and recreation areas. So, you know, all elements that uh, would, would define them as dwelling units. Um, and, you know, the need for um, updating our ordinance is that while today these cottages that you see um, would be considered for an ADU permit, these ones would not. So, again, simply the addition of wheels. Um, would uh, under our current ordinances make uh, make these structures today illegal. Some of the advantages of tiny homes, they're um, much cheaper to build than um, other alternatives. So uh, you can buy a very nice movable tiny home today uh, from the range of $85,000 and you build one in three to five months. Um, you know, compare that to the average cost of a stick built ADU in the, in the Bay Area at $156,000 and taking 18 months um, or the average cost of constructing a uh, market rate apartment unit of uh, $450,000. So obviously our community is struggling with affordable housing and uh, tiny homes and movable tiny homes provide um, an excellent option for uh, you know, creating alternative forms of housing that are affordable. Um, and you know, our, certainly as a county, we can't afford to, um, or to subsidize the creation of uh, market rate housing or um, uh, you know, uh, apartment housing um, directly through um, through other means, and so tiny homes create a much better alternative. Um, just some elements of a definition that are taken from the various codes uh, or, or ordinances, as I said, adopted by other jurisdictions. Um, you know, registered and licensed with the DMV. Um, uh, wheels and undercarriage would be skirted, uh, designed to look like a conventional building. Um, if it is, uh, if, if wheels are not removed, that it have some kind of uh, foundation or support. Um, you know, today we've just proposed uh, the creation uh, or, or the beginning of a process to create an ordinance. ordinance. So none so of these specifics, specifics are, are actually uh, included, included in the recommended action. Um, but these are some of the elements that um, I, I would like to see personally um, uh, in, a, in a finalized ordinance. Design elements, elements as well, well can um, ensure, ensure that they, they look, look uh, like, like regular, regular dwelling dwelling units. units. Um, you know, we, you know, we didn't, didn't want to just, just end, end with, with a proposal, proposal to, uh, to, to include tiny homes on wheels as a use because there's other considerations as well. like. Um, actually, the creation of tiny house communities like the one you see here, Tiny Tranquility in Waldport, Oregon. Uh, as um, for, for 
people of, of many different income levels. And so ultimately we wanna be able to plan for this kind of use uh, as well as tiny homes as primary dwellings in the future. And so that's why I, uh, the recommended action actually suggests um, looking at making tiny homes both primary dwellings as well as um, you know, other code updates necessary to allow tiny house communities like this. Why are we considering this now? Um, well, rebuilding after the fire, obviously, uh, is a huge challenge for our community. And legalizing tiny homes is really going to just create more options for people as they think about how they're going to ultimately move back onto their property. We, of course, there, there's, we are currently allowing um, mobile homes and RVs, uh, temporary use on, on, um, on properties affected by the fire. Uh, uh, however, you know, yeah, having, having a long-term long -term assurance, assurance that, that a little tiny, tiny home uh, uh, will, will be allowed in the future could allow a family, family to build a new movable tiny house offsite, to, uh, start work on that today, move it on site, um, ultimately keep that as an ADU, and then continue and, and pursue a primary dwelling uh, or construction of a primary dwelling, or you know, even if the if the village concept is approved, um, moving another movable tiny home on site as well. So it's just going to create more options for people uh, as they look at moving back onto the property. And of course, you know, also our, we have an urgent need to address homelessness in our community. As I've mentioned before, this was the number one issue I heard on the campaign uh, trail. And um, we've seen tiny homes play a crucial role in addressing homelessness in other communities. Uh, you have an overview here of Community First Village in Austin, Texas which started off uh, with uh, parking spaces for some RVs and then moved into creating a movable uh, or a tiny house village on site as well. Um, it's been such a successful community that uh, they're expect soon to house more than 50% of the chronically homeless in Travis County. Tiny homes fit nicely into our operational plan. Um, so this would be section two, uh, goal C, strategy two. Um, to pilot initiatives to expand housing options for people of all incomes and increase and diversify housing options. So the recommended actions today, um, as I alluded to, are to direct the planning department to explore, explore a permitting process for tiny homes uh, to include, but not to be limited to, the addition of tiny homes within the county's accessory dwelling unit ordinance and or recognition of tiny homes as primary residences within a new standalone ordinance. And also to uh, direct the planning department to return to the board on February 23rd with a proposed process and timeline for gathering input about the permitting of tiny homes for members of the public planning commission and individual board offices. That's it. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. Thank you for bringing this item uh, along to my office to, I applaud you for getting right to work on this idea, which has come up numerous times over the past several years. I do support exploring what a permitting process would look like because we need more affordable housing. There's no question about that. And products other than just large apartment buildings or uh, multifamily projects here and there throughout the county. Um, one of our affordability goals is to promote home ownership and tiny homes can really be a, a roadway to achieve that. And I really appreciate that as well as uh, if we do come to some agreement on how we're going to do this, it will have a, a reduced impact on our land uh, use and our water resources that we have here in the county. Uh, there's a lot of creativity, creativity in, in developing these individual tiny homes. Um, I really look forward to the public process that will help us determine how to move forward on this. I know folks in my uh, fifth district uh, have expressed interest in developing such an ordinance and possibly locating uh, tiny homes there. Uh, so I do appreciate your getting right on this and bringing it forward to the Board of Supervisors. Um, are there any comments from the board? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig, for bringing this forward. It's exciting that the state has, is now allowing frameworks for local communities to do this. I do have some questions and I recognize um, you, you answered a little bit more of it with your presentation. The, the staff report was, was a little bit vague on some of the details, but um, for example, the current ADU ordinance allows ADUs to be as small as 150 square feet. So I was trying to determine at least from a foundation standpoint, not the movable ones, but a foundation standpoint, 
other than the reduction to 100 square feet, what would be substantively different uh, in this proposal? So, so I, I guess I can try to answer that. So you're, you're asking what would be substantively different from an ADU? So our current, our current ADU ordinance allows for for an ADU to be as small as 150 square feet. So a tiny home could be as small as 100 square feet, but if it's on a foundation, so it's an ADU basically, mm -hmm. um, which could be a conversion or a standalone. I was just trying to determine, because what it seems like is that you're actually suggesting a completely different set of building standards for this. And so I, what I wanted to see is then, are we encouraging sort of in that 100 to 400, uh, a shift in how we would look at building standards for ADUs, because we currently have a very, uh, in fact, a model ADU ordinance that's been replicated across the state. Um, so I, I wasn't sure what the substantive difference then was for say, uh, somebody came in, wanted to build a 150 square foot ADU, they could do that today versus what you would be talking about if they wanted to build a 150 square foot, say tiny home on a foundation. Right, I think the more substantive difference is, is allowing a 150 square foot movable tiny home, which would not be legal uh, under today's ADU ordinance, right? The fact that it is on built on a chassis um, and is you know ultimately ultimately movable. Um, and so that's why uh, we would still, you know, I, many of the model ordinances that I've looked at would still require some kind of foundation under that chassis, chassis whether it's decomposed granite um, or other way um, you know, to make sure that this is the structure is not simply sinking into the mud, um, as well as elements like skirting to hide the wheels. Um, but I think that is the biggest distinction as far as you know, ADUs, movable, um, tiny homes is is the element that it's built on a chassis, and it's important actually because um, you know it it allows incremental home ownership, right? And that someone could own their their movable tiny home, rent the space for the ADU. Uh, or, or rent the rent the space from a friend who has the property, um, but still they're they're um, building equity at least in the the tiny home itself. And so it really, you know, even though it sounds like a minor difference, I think it's a, a significant change um, that to to allow movable tiny homes in this way. Well, one of the things I appreciate you clarifying that. I mean, to me though, just the language of the staff report made it seem like there was on foundation and movable. Um, I'm not totally clear then. It sounds almost like it's movable being placed on a foundation. And so those, they maybe aren't two distinct categories then actually as as the staff report implies. So it's just something to, well, I mean, this is gonna get fleshed out. Obviously the board's gonna support moving this forward, but these details are gonna matter because what I'm trying to see is whether, um, what other sort of impacts it, it could in theory create. When we went through the ADU process, for example, it's a use and you can live in your ADU and now rent out your primary house. So say you're trying to downsize uh, your family's trying to move in or whatever it may be. But we also restricted it from being, you being able to say rent your primary residence or your former primary residence as, an, as a vacation rental, for example. So um, we would, we would want to ensure that if we're changing codes to incent somebody to move into a tiny home that maybe isn't necessarily, um, that's their only home in the first place, but they're trying to downsize or it's or whatever the reason that we also aren't trying to, we're not now creating a, a back end. <laughs> On something like vacation rentals, some sort of additional uh, component. Also on the movable, I mean, are, are, would generators be allowed? Could, would somebody, I mean, are they self-powered? Does somebody plug in from a home? Um, would we look differently in the coastal zone versus or the urban services line versus the rural services line? I mean, out in Coralitos, which you're exceptionally well aware of, there's all kinds of space and that would look very different than what could be allowed in the urban services line. So are we, are we considering in this ordinance having differences depending upon say zoning or size of parcel? I think those are things that are gonna have to be fleshed out based on public feedback, um, input from your office and other supervisors offices uh, as well as the planning department. Okay, I mean, generally when we introduce a concept like this, we provide sort of a framework to the planning department to start the construct though, right? And so that's why I wanted to raise some of these questions. I thought maybe you, I mean, if you knew you do, if not, if it was just- I can, I can say that I haven't seen any significant distinctions um, in the other ordinances I've looked at um, between one, you know, anything that mentions an urban services line or a distinction between uh, different zoning types. Okay. All right, well, I mean, I think that these are gonna be the issues that are gonna be uh, fleshed because we, we went through this with the ADUs and, and we went, well, we went pretty far and then the state ended up doing a great job of actually going further and we adopted 
that um, when that time came. But on this, I want to be sure that we're not doing something that actually has an adverse impact by not thinking through uh, some of these things. And I think you're on board with that. We're just trying to increase affordable housing. I think everybody on the board is there. Um, and I hope that this is a creative way to do it. I appreciate you two both bringing it forward. But those will be the questions I'll, I'll have once the we work with the planning department on the formation of an ordinance. Thank you. Any other comments from the board, board members? Uh, I'll make a, a comment or a question. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward. It's very interesting. And uh, uh, when we're talking about 100 square foot, uh, I guess that's uh, that's the smallest minimum size. Is that correct? Uh, that's that's how it's been defined uh, in, in some other ordinances. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, that's 10 by 10. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, okay, this it, it's 100 square feet for the tiny homes or it's 150 square feet for an ADU. What, I'm get, I've got them mixed up right now. I believe the current requirement is 150 square feet for uh, minimum size for ADUs. Right. Okay. Thank so you. I, I, and and that's part of you know this process is that planning would ultimately reconcile our existing ADU ordinance, uh, you know, with with de a definition of tiny home, movable tiny homes. Um, so if that you know if that is 100 uh, 100 square feet is allowable for a movable tiny home and 150 for Sure. Uh, you know, a, a stick built on a foundation. Um, you know, those distinctions can be um, fleshed out in this process. You bet. And then uh, water, uh, uh, cooking, and all that. I, it's hard to envision all of that taking place at 100 square feet. I guess, I guess, like a small mobile home or something like that. Not a mobile home, but a, a RV. Uh, I guess it could be done. Okay, that could all be worked out later. Yeah, and there, and there is um, a, a, a section Q to the California Building Code, um, which um, allows for a little, uh, you know, or gives greater allowances as far as uh, ladders, crawl space, um, fire escape, uh, uh, emergency escapes for from fire um, for these kinds of structures. Yeah, I, it's just uh, it's hard for me to imagine uh, something that small having everything that somebody needs to uh, live. I'd hate to see the size of the uh, the bathroom. I mean, uh, if uh, if anybody was of large stature, they might have a hard time getting in there. Huh? <laughs> okay. Is there any other comments from board members? Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, I, I appreciate bringing this forward. It's always good to look at new innovations. As Supervisor Friend says, the devil's always in the uh, details and figuring out how this works um, <clears throat> with our existing zoning and land use requirements. But uh, I look forward to that process going forward. Thank you. Uh, no, no other comments. This is not a public hearing. This is a direction, but I would like to have a, a vote and a motion for to... Um, to uh, approve that direction to the planning department. I'll uh, move for approval. Uh, before we do that, we do, it is an item on the regular agenda. We do have public comment. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we'll rush to get done, okay. <laughs> We're comment? almost there. We, we have one person. If you would hold on, I will share my screen. Okay. Oops, we now have two people. So we're going to start with the person whose telephone number ends in 2915. You're being asked to be unmuted. Once you start, the timer will begin. Thank you. Hello, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Koenig, thank you for bringing this, um, this fresh action to the public and to the board. I, I really appreciate it. I ask that the county's Housing Advisory Commission also be involved in this. There are some very knowledgeable people there that will have good input as well. I also have questions about um, hookups for water and septic or sewage. Um, I'm aware that SoCal Creek Water District 
treats ADUs as a separate connection and imposes fees, very high mm -hmm. fees, I might add, for ADUs. So um, that sort of issue should also be vetted with the local water agencies and um, the county environmental health in terms of hooking up to septic if that is not, uh, if there is septic involved. I happen to know of one tiny home that is out in the rural area with an incinerating toilet and the problem it causes with the odors for the neighborhood um, is a problem. So that sort of issue really needs to be discussed. I. Um, I also applaud the idea of having designated communities, as uh, you brought up, Supervisor Koenig, with eco-villages, perhaps um, similar age groups or whatever. Um, I think that would be a real plus. And the county owns land, such as in Watsonville, behind the, um, the clinic there on Freedom Boulevard, mm -hmm. that could be put to use for this very purpose. I do question, however, that this could help the county meet the RENA numbers because these are mobile housing units. And what if they move out of the area? How could we really attribute them to helping us um, meet our RENA numbers without some sort of tracking? Um, I also Thank you. And we have one more um, caller. With the speaker, Jerry Peters, you are our next speaker. I'm going to unmute you. When you accept that unmuting, you can begin speaking and I will start the timer. You will have two minutes. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I just actually have two comments. One goes back a little bit. I just wanted to make the comment that it seems we're not reading web comments any longer. Uh, the option is still there on the agenda. And, and I know for a fact I made a comment earlier and I know others who have made web comments and they're not being read. Just wanted to put that out there. But that being said, thank you, um, Supervisor Koning, for bringing this, you know, the small, the tiny homes into the arena to be looked at. I think this is a big movement across the country, and I think there's big possibilities for folks in this area to be able to explore that as far as having affordable housing. I would ask, um, in, in part of your direction to the planning department, to put forth some direction to not necessarily reinvent the wheel, to look at other areas um, across the country or even across the state that have guidelines set forth already so that we're not, like I said, reinventing the wheel and making it more difficult to get some of these things done. Um, and I definitely appreciate Becky Steinbrenner's comment about the incinerating toilet, but I think um, looking at the possibility of composting toilets with, with these um, tiny homes could be an excellent solution for folks, especially um, in areas such as the San Lorenzo Valley with limited um, with limited capacity in their septics, and that has been a limitation for ED for them for a long time. Thank you so much. And Chair, I do not see any other people with their hands up and for the public comment. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, we will move back to the board uh, for uh, a motion to uh, for the to initiate the direction to the planning department to uh, include planning homes uh, in our, our planning process. So we have probably a motion by Supervisor Tony. Yes, I'll move the recommended actions. And and I'll, I will second. Um, and I think that um, this may be implied in the motion, but I think that was a good suggestion to go to the Housing Advisory Commission, obviously the Planning Commission over time. So I don't know if you consider that just a friendly amendment to consider, I think you already talked about this, considering ordinances are already in effect as the as a, as a presenter had said, but also that we go to our Housing Advisory Commission and also the Planning Commission in advance of coming back to the board. I'm happy to accept that as a friendly amendment. Right, I, I would like to second. I appreciate you bringing it forward. Thank you, now, uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Brand? Aye. Coonerty? Aye. Caput? Aye. Chair McPherson? Hi. Right. Okay, that concludes our regular agenda for today. Um, we will move, now move into a closed session. And I'll, we have two items, uh, a conference with legal counsel on the threat to public services or facilities, and a conference with legal counsel on pending litig legis uh, litigation, government code section 54950.9D1. Uh, Ms. Uh, County counsel, are the, any actions reportable? 
Thank you, Chair McPherson. There are no reportable actions. Okay, then I will move that we uh, recess into the uh, uh, the closed session, and after which we will adjourn. Uh, the next Board of Supervisors meeting will be next uh, Tuesday, February 2nd at 9 a.m. on February 2nd, 2021. With that, uh, we will move into closed session. Thank you. Okay. I will we'll take, a, it's 10 minutes to one. Let's meet at uh, one o'clock. Let's uh, just take 10 minutes and. Uh...